all the council members are present, town attorney, town clerk, and interim, interim sitting town manager, Jason Freeman. Uh, if you please rise for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Accept our thanks for this day with all its blessings and opportunities. Thank you for every seat that has been filled here today, for each mind and heart that fills the presence of this room, as well as the lives of those we will encounter afterward. We meet today asking for guidance, wisdom, and support to engage in meaningful discussion for our leaders as they render service to our fellow citizens and community. Ready us to make every moment count. Amen. So you schedule public uh, hearings? Yes, sir. Okay. Before we do oh, public, we need to vote to approve okay. the agenda as amended. I'll, I'll move we uh, approve the agenda as amended. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries unanimously. Before we do public comment, we've got Representative Adam Batana here. You want to come up and say a few words, sir? Thanks for coming. Is there a light on this thing? No. Okay. Uh, Council, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to be back up here in Fort Myers Beach. Just wanted to go over a few things, kind of a little preview of what happened in Tallahassee. You guys have seen a lot. I just wanted to give you, uh, and actually open it up for any questions that you do have, okay? Uh, appropriations this year, along with my, I have to recognize Julie Inman, my legislative aide, uh, great girl, and uh, my right hand up there, a lot of you know her. She works a lot with you. So uh, this year with Hurricane Ian, there's been a lot of issues, obviously. Appropriations were a big thing on our forefront. Uh, we put in, um, our office put in over $300 million in appropriations for all of our district. Now, District 80 encompasses from Immokalee Road in Collier County all the way up to Boca Grande. That encompasses also Stero, Bonita, Fort Myers Beach, San Al Sanibel, Pine Island, and Boca Grande. Uh, so with that, there's a pot of money that's been set aside, $350 million, which will be ran by Kevin Guffey from DEM. And you got to know you guys are all familiar with him pretty well. He's been here day two pretty much. Uh, of that pot, there's $117 million that we can pull out of that pot for uh, appropriations for this area, which includes turtle lights, town hall, um, fire stations, everything along those lines. Now, that has come through the state and uh, DEM is gonna be pushing that. Now, this is the same procedure that happened in Bay County. Um, so it's just kind of going up from there to kind of, they, they've done this process and I totally have full confidence that Kevin Guthrie's gonna do us right. In that Adam, before, before you move on real quick, yeah. when you say this area, do you mean your district our or district. just yeah. the town of Fort Myers Beach? So no, this our district, district. Okay. So, so the, this district in there. So that's um, Adam. Yeah. Just just for continued clarification, first of all, thank sure. you for all your kind assistance. You've been great through all of this. So the just so we again, just for folks who might be listening, the three hundred and fifty is that for Southwest Florida or for the entire state of Florida? And so that hurricanes? that pot. Thanks for great question. So that pot is for the Hurricane Ian and Nicole recovery. Okay. So you know, Volusia County dealt with a lot of beach. You know, there's not a, nothing like this that we see right here. Uh, but they did do the deal with some collapsed houses. Beach renourishment was an issue. Uh, they had some road failures. So that pot, and again, folks, this is money that's here right now. This money, you know, as soon as the governor signs a budget, of course, and there might be some changes, that will be available July 1. That's money that's here for us today. Um, so this is the first step. You know, we'll be in session in September. Again, we'll be in committee week. So we'll be going back again with open hands and uh, luckily with our, our great legislature, our great governor, 
uh, that we will be uh, refunded again. So funded again, obviously. And again, Adam, just just again to further clarify, sure. the 117 million, which which is great, appreciate it very much. Is that for? Would you define that as a is a group of legislative districts, or is it more Lee County? Is it more that, Collier County, or how does it work? No, that 117 million is in my district. That's 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 117 mi uh, million for your district alone. Yes, that's that's great. Thank you. So that's, I mean that that's that that's out of the appropriations that we put in. That's what we can draw out of it. Okay. Can and I it, just yeah, say, yeah. as a former legislator, that's tremendous. So we're very thankful for your hard work on that. No, no problem. And it's a team effort. You know, guys, you came up here. Uh, we've had great great relationship with all our legislators wow. in the area that have done awesome. You know, we've worked with the county, we've worked with the city, we worked with everybody coming up there. But there's a little bit more to it too. So we also got 76 million for infrastructure. So that'd be 51 million for the for the Santa Bell Causeway, six million for Big Hickory, the stuff along Estero Boulevard. That is the match that we provided to the county so we can get those working on there. Also another 14 million in water quality projects. And that's all through the whole district there too. Additionally, another you know, probably five or six million in just eye clinics and everything along those lines. So we've had a great year for our area. But what I want to tell the council is this is step one, okay? Uh, there's there's a lot of organizations out there. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. And I think it's great. We all need to work together and get that done. The reason we have this, you know, and other people's like, well, why didn't we just get 25 million for Fort Myers Beach uh, Town Hall? Well, because number one, we can't spend 25 million in one year. We're going to take a chunk of that and we're going to come back next year and go again and go again. So we'll keep it going like that. And that's why I have faith in our, our uh, DEM with Kevin Guthrie that he's going to do it the right way because we do have another pot of money that's coming out there with resiliently where that's come through the Fed. So that's a 1.1 billion. Okay, but that's going to be a couple years from now because that takes a process to get through that. The same. Those are those are all pots of money that are going to come down here, and we're gonna we're gonna make sure that everything gets spent the right way, because obviously the state does not want to be on a dime that the Fed's going to pay it. So we're gonna have a constant. And the thing is, communication's key, and you guys do a great job of it. You know, these are things that you guys do. You come, you call me. That's that's what we need to keep doing at, at all levels to make sure that we bring back this city the way it needs to be. So, also in addition to that, we want to talk about beach renourishment. That is done through DEP. Uh, and also, we've got to talk about uh, fire station. We were just talking a minute ago. Again, that's through, going to be through Governor Guthrie and revenue replacement. I know you guys just got your report. Uh, I know Holly Smith was calling me and crying <laughs> about 40% off. But I want to let you know that the state's here to help you. You know, I know you guys already got, I think it was 11 million. 11.9. 11.9 for revenue replacement. I know the county is going to ask for 25 million for their area. And then I know Fort My uh, Santa Bell is going to be right around 15. But again, guys, we're going to go back up there. That pot will be renourished, and we'll constantly keep seeing what we can do to help you and get this town back on our feet. We're not going to leave you out to dry for sure. Is there any questions I can assist with or anything along those lines? Well, Ed, thanks for coming first off. Appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to kind of comment that being on the resilient lead, that, that there are also uh, one of the buzzwords we're talking now is resiliency hubs. So the idea is you'd put, you know, like a town hall with a, um, a, an EOC in it. You'd harden communications. You'd make that a, you know, a robust facility, but also in the area. So I think there's probably, I know that um, the Chairman Moraine is very keen on trying to leverage as much of that, um, that block grant money as possible. So it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to maybe get ourselves a town hall built, but then use the area there where there's some available properties to maybe get some of the block grant money and, le and leverage you know, the money that you're talking about to, to build a structure that if we ever have another hurricane like that, that we'll be able to communicate and function as a government. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Beach. You know, it, it's a great process, and I think the Resilient Lee is a great organization. I think that's a long-term plan we have to work on. This is money that we're talking about right now that came from the state. This is stuff that we can work on right now as soon as it's signed and as July 1st. So uh, I, we've got an email from Kevin Guthrie and Luke Strickland. We forwarded it to you. I think I forwarded it to Chris Holly. Sorry to the new city manager. Whatever he is. He's, he's, he's out of the country. Oh, well, go for it. Uh, but <laughs> Part-timer. <laughs> all right. Come on. We got. I thought we got over this, guys. Um, you know, but I did talk to Chris Holly, and, you know, he's been a big help. So we're, you know, there's some uh, meetings set up to just kind of editorial. So I go through the process, how you, you reply for it. It goes through the issue and co comes out through there. 
Uh, but I have to say, guys, you know, the governor was here day two, you know, uh, and uh, the state legislature is going to support you and we'll get you back here. You know, we've had tons of representatives here on the ground. I know we had Dan out and, and uh, Jim a couple times with a bunch of freshmen. We had a the whole sophomore class here and a bunch of juniors, too. So it's like high school, but uh, it's like a field trip. But everybody's coming out here and we all know we need to need the help. So but just wanted to clarify a couple things. The money that's coming now, the money's going to come later. And again, this is round one. You know, we'll go back up there next year. We'll go back up there the year after and the year after. You know, I know uh, being up in the legislature, they're still asking money for Hurricane Michael in Bay County. So there's still things. So we need to hit it hot in it right now. But as the years progress, you know, it'll be a little bit tougher to sell it. But we'll, we'll get you back there. So any other questions? Sure. If I could, a, yeah. a, a couple things. Number one, I'll, I'll just say it again. And I said this a few months ago when you did it. But the fact that you and how you rallied your colleagues to come down here right after the storm was really I think unprecedented. I've never seen whole classes of of, 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 of of representatives come and visit an area all together and have the collegiality that you've helped uh, foster. You do it right in Florida there. Yeah, and it was very impressive. And, and, and they were impressed by, by, by visiting. And I know the mayor did a great job of working with you and your team out in Tallahassee, up in Tallahassee. And it was just, it was just a tremendous, tremendous to watch that effort and that partnership. So I thank you for that. The, uh, just as we just, think about the 117 million going forward again assuming the budget gets signed on july 1st and it's, it stays the same it, it, it'll go through dem and through kevin guthrie who's been uh, great to work with uh will you kind of have some influence into that in other words would you will you be a partner in that process as we set our priorities and kind of work as a as a kind of a liaison with with dem or how will that work procedurally or what would you recommend for us Thank you for the question. Uh, no, we will be very, our, our office will be very involved with everything that happens at DM. Uh, Kevin Guthrie's always been the first phone call away. He's always right there and he knows the needs. You know, I think he still has some employees. I don't know if they do or not on the island, um, but uh, we'll be involved 100%, you know, with this. You know, if it's Turtle Lights, which is a horrible name for an appropriation. But those are things that we are going to be involved in. I know that's on the forefront. We need to light up this community because that's important. You know, it's important to the whole town. Uh, but we will be involved every step of the way with anything. But I want to say, you guys have my cell phone number. If there's any issues, call me. You know, if you have a problem, call me. You know, let me know what's going on or you have concerns. Again, uh, there is a couple, I would say, um, they're going to try to walk you through, I think, June 10th. There's a class in June 15th. There's a class. There's a few of them that we've sent out. I'll be there. Julie will be there. You know, we'll all be there and just kind of go through the process. You know, this is the first time that Department of Emergency Management is going through this. So we're going to have to give them just a little bit, but it's pretty much pen and paper. This is what we got. This is how we apply and go from there. So, you know, I think it's smart because there's some politics that dealt with the $1.1 billion from HUD with our governor. Uh, so there's a little bit of politics that dealt with that. Unfortunately, we get dragged in the middle of it. But the state doesn't want to blow money that's going to be paid up by FEMA, you know, along that process. So we got to make sure that we, you know, look at every avenue to get refunded, obviously. And again, uh, just for the folks who may be watching, to just to get have them a better, give them a better sense of the Herculean effort that you've put forth. The the uh, the the uh, eleven point nine is that what it was? The, that that's a bridged loan. Mm -hmm. The 117 million you're talking about are grants, which yep. do not need to be paid back. Yep. That's pretty significant. I just thought that was worth emphasizing so folks can differentiate between the two. So yeah. thanks again for being here this morning. Sure. Any, anything you guys ever need, just call me. You know, we try to keep it simple. Any other questions? Any other questions for Adam? Thanks for all you've done. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was good to see you guys over at Publix yeah, on the way up there this yourself. morning. <laughs> a little early for pub subs, but it was all right. But uh, Yet you were the first in line. <laughs> we're cuddly. What can I say, Dan? We're cuddly. The chicken Puffy. wasn't available yet. <laughs> but it, it's it's good to see you guys. I have to say I'm just really proud of our whole district, how everybody's pulled together and uh, really built back. I mean, before the storm, we, we had a relationship, and after the storm, we, we, we've hung out and, you know, really gotten closer and closer. And it's, it's key, guys. And the thing is I always tell everybody is, just be involved and be, you know, get commu communications key. If you got any problem, we really need to put all egos to the side and just work on what's good for our area. And it, it's tough in politics sometimes. I mean, Jim, you, you can understand that. But we just need to take care of what's good for our area and get this rebuilt. Fort Myers Beach is going to look 
better and better in Santa Bell and everywhere else. So we'll be making our rounds this month. So if you need anything, please let me know. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thanks Thank for you. all the help you gave me up in uh, Tallahassee being the first time ever being up there and, and walking those halls. It is a little daunting, but uh, to see how relaxed you and your colleagues are when you're up there, it's it's like talking to your friends. It's not, uh, and they were very, very supportive. So appreciate you guys welcoming me up there and, and, uh, and being the face, I guess, if you will, of the community yeah. to uh, tell our story. And, Don't and, worry, uh, you'll be back again. We'll, be, we'll have you up there. <laughs> yeah, you guys are going to start locking the doors every time <laughs> I show up. We <laughs> invite all of you to come up and uh, take yeah, a look at it. So. It's, it's, it's definitely an experience. Thanks, Thank Adam. You. Appreciate it. Thanks, Julie. Now we'll open it up for public comment. Madam Clerk. Uh, first, first up is Linda Miller, and after Ms. Miller will be Mary Rose Spoletta. I'm so glad to be back. Mm -hmm. Pull that down. Down. <laughs> I'm so glad to be back, and I'm so glad to see you guys. And I applaud you for all the work you've done. It's just amazing how fast every week we see improvements, and I just can't thank you all enough for all the hard work you do behind the scenes. So. Uh, to, to everyone who doesn't know, I'm Linda Miller. I ran the farmer's markets uh, since 2015 down here at Beach Baptist and then later at Santini Plaza. And we were able to double those markets and do two days a week at each location. Um, they are wonderful community events, great family fun, free to attend, very rare thing for an event to be free to attend on Fort Myers Beach for tourists and residents alike. About 70% of our um, customers were bikers, walkers. Uh, they just walked to the market. It wasn't a huge um, traffic problem. But I'm here today today ask your support uh, for a farmer's market under the bridge. And what I'd like you to know is um, that the first market uh, in this area was in 1934, there was a, a market. That's the article in front of you. But there was a market on Third Street, going back as far as 1934. Then under the bridge market uh, existed from 2000 to 2015, 2015. So for 15 years, the market under the bridge existed until it got moved to Bay Oaks where it lacked advertising and it lacked visibility. And it just disintegrated in that one quick three months or whatever um, that it was moved to Bay Oaks. So what we're asking is, since we don't have any foreseeable future for Beach Baptist Farmer's Market, we're asking if you would approve a farmer's market back under the bridge. And we really think that this would be a great community event. For the last eight years, we have been asked over and over from the north end of the island, why can't you have a farmer's market on the north end of the island? And when we build back Fort Myers Beach, you'll probably have the same segregation that we did before, which was uh, North people don't like to travel mid-island, mid-island people don't like to travel the South Island, and so they have always wanted a farmer's market for the past eight years back under the bridge. So just asking you for that, um, a little, little tidbit too is that uh, not only are we a great community event, but we are one of those events that um, when people are planning their vacation to come down, they look for things to do. And we had at Beach Baptist and Santini Markets, we had 60,000 Google views per month. Now, even though we haven't even been in operation for a year, we still have about 15,000 Google views per month. So this is a great attractor to get more tourists and people planning their vacations down here. So thank I would you. just want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Mary Rose? After Mary Rose will be Tony Mariello. Hello, good morning. Um, Mayor Allers, Vice Mayor Adderholt, Councilman King, Councilman Woodson, and Councilman Veach. It, it's you I'm singling out because it's you I'm speaking to specifically, although this is for everyone, well, those of you here and, and those of you at home. I, I'm here because I strongly object to the town's continued involvement in the Audubon versus the Boardwalk lawsuit. The Audubon case is very strong 
and the Audubon Society is very committed to its successful completion. On the other hand, the, uh, the town has a very weak position that benefits only a handful of select people. I believe that the town's resources, especially at this time, the resources that involve time, personnel, and money, can certainly be better used by spending our efforts on the massive ongoing redevelopment project we have here on our beach. I ask therefore that you please rescind the boardwalk ordinance and that you end this boardwalk lawsuit ASAP. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mary Rose. Tony? After Tony will be Wendy Heron. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Mariello, and uh, I am a lead instructor for the University of Florida Master Naturalist Program uh, here in Lee County in collaboration with Lover's Key State Park. Um, since 1992, thousands of men and women uh, wanting to be good stewards of the local eco ecosystem have been certified through this program. Part of the program includes field trips and when covering shorebirds, I bring the cl class to one of the last remaining rookeries in Lee County, Carlos Point, where at least a half dozen species of beach nesting birds like Wilson's plover, snowy plovers, which are state threatened, by the way, least terns and black skimmers, which have used the area forever, as well as federally threatened wintering red knots and piping plovers. If you knew the story of red, red knots, you'd be amazed how they know when to leave um, Maine to get here to raise their young. It's absolutely fascinating. But anyway, that's another story. So uh, you might also know that I believe FWC designated the spot as a critical wildlife area. So the graduates return to Carlos Point often to observe the nesting birds in fall, uh, the maturing of the fledlings all winter, and their uh, migration north in the spring. And also hundreds of birders come here knowing about this particular habitat to observe the birds as well. Uh, if this private boardwalk that, we're, uh, that was approved is constructed, I don't believe I could rationally explain how this project was approved by the council. So uh, I urge you to reconsider that decision. Thank you, do you have any questions? No, we don't take any questions, but appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Wendy Heron, and after Wendy will be Cindy Johnson. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. I'm here because I obviously object to this uh, bridge. It's not a walkover, it's a bridge. You might want to try speaking into the mic. Yeah. It's a bridge, not a walkover. Uh, 300 feet long, I don't think that's a walkover. That's a bridge. Anyway, the matter was decided twice by previous councils. Now, because the Texans seem to have friends on the board, the matter has taken a different direction. It's called critical wildlife area for a reason. We've already gotten birds nesting in the sand right where the proposed bridge will be. If this goes through, the publicity will be detrimental to the tourist trade you've covered, not to mention the cost of being sued by Audubon. Previously, we were not incurring fees for a lawsuit. Now we are. If you rescind your vote for this bridge, this cost would be negated, saving the town unnecessary legal fees. Think about it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Cindy? After Cindy will be Jennifer Rusk. Good morning, council. Good morning, interim, interim. Good morning, <laughs> town attorney. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Sarah. I'm here today. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little story and hopefully this helps you understand where we're at. So I was doing laundry at Beach Baptist and I met one of Mr. Rood and Mr. Kramer's um, neighbors. And we bonded over permitting, living in trailers, et cetera went on to street lights, how he wasn't so sure about that. And he was uncomfortable with the situation and now he understands it. And he believes that 
we need to put more information in the papers about all of this so everyone can understand about the amber lights that we need to have here. But then we went on to the berm and how he wasn't happy with the berm. He's working with Chad. Chad's trying to talk him into it. And we talked about the berm and he understands that that it would be a good thing for his property to protect his property. And then, of course, I told him, well, I know about the berm because I actually go to weekly meetings about the berm. I know all about the construction. I know about how they have to protect the wildlife here. Actually, I mean, I'm a volunteer for turtle time. And he said, the birds, the birds, the birds, the FWC should not be roping off areas for birds on my private property. He said, I've been contacting the state. I'm very upset about this. I said, well, let's talk about that a little bit. Do you understand that the FWC, with this berm project, they have to rope off every area that there is a berm, uh, a, a bird nest. And it has to be 300 feet. In the radius is 300 feet. That means a 600 foot diameter. And that's to protect one bird nest. And he thought about it. And I said, so they have to do that, just like we have to stake the turtle nest because we can't have people walking over the turtle nest. And uh, would you be objectionable if I put a turtle nest, if I staked out a turtle nest on your property? No. So then I said, now that you know this, how do you feel about that? He said, I think that the town needs to educate its residents on how we are to protect our birds and why we are doing this. So I, I'm asking you today to please, hopefully, Jenny, get some more information out there so we're not surprising people because birds nesting season is far from over right now. And it's interesting that I've known all along about the birds. I learned all that this year. And our construction crew knows all about how we have to protect the berm, but our general public does not, and you probably didn't know that either. I just want to add one more thing. As of Thursday, we have four Wilson plover nests and two snowy plover nests within 50 feet of the proposed walkover, 50 feet. And that obviously is far from the 300 foot radius that we're supposed to keep from, from these nests. And there are only a little over 900 adult Wilson plovers in the state of Florida, and just over a little over 400 snowy plover nests or plo snowy plover adults. So hopefully, this gives you a little more perspective. I'm sure there's people. If you sought out more information, would be glad to help you. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Cindy. Jennifer. After Jennifer will be Steve Johnson. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Council, Jennifer Rusk, uh, FMD resident. Uh, I'm here to talk about a few different things. Um, one is I'm super excited. Uh, the Fort Myers Beach Community Foundation uh, awarded us last month for the MRF pop-up $5,000. And I was thinking during the um, time that they were awarding us what we would do with this money. Um, and after I got up and was given the check, uh, Jeff uh, got up, and uh, he's the new congratulations, Jeff, wherever you are. And I thought when he was awarded some money uh, for the Mound House, and he announced that they would be giving, starting up uh, the summer camp at Mound House for the beach kids. And a light bulb went off, and I thought, you know, one of the things that we give away at the pop-ups are kids' activity books, educational material, and we lost all of that. So I thought, well, maybe this is what we can do. We can get the kids, the beach kids, to do something and collaborate with Jeff and the Mound House and the beach uh, summer camp and get the kids to write about what they've learned during their summer camp, what they've learned about, what they've learned on their beach uh, um, uh, outings, and also give them a sense of pride. And we'll develop our own Fort Myers Beach, um, I'm, I'm thinking BFF, uh, Beach Friends Forever activity book. So I'm super excited about that. And we've all agreed, Murph agreed as well. 
So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the second thing would be that I am against this walkover. Um, and I wrote down some thoughts that I had. Um, well, so if you have ever been on a beach where there's boardwalks going out to the beach, they're lined up. It, you have to zigzag through at high tide. It takes away that beautiful look. If you ever get on the beach and look out, you can see as far as you can see. And I really think it will ruin our beach because you've opened a can of worms. Once you allow one person to have a beach boardwalk, not a walkover, but it's a boardwalk, once you allow one person, you're going to have to allow everyone, and everyone will want one. So I was also disappointed at the last, uh, one of the previous council meetings when I, one of you council members had um, brought up how to push through this permit. I was super disappointed in this because your constituents, many business owners, homeowners are still waiting on their permits. I think it's irresponsible to be worried about someone's boardwalk when there's so many of us right now trying to get back into our homes and businesses. So I'm gonna ask you to please rescind with this decision. And thank you so much for all the hard work that you do. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Thank you, Ginger. Keep up the good work with that tent. <laughs> Steve? After that, I have email comments. Okay. Good morning. Oh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Sad. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council folks, Interim, interim. <coughs> and uh, Mr. Heron and Amy. I'm here today to really voice my displeasure and, and just disappointment to Town Council on their approval of a special exception uh, to construct uh, and allow encroachment onto the beach. Uh, the previous applications for this project to build a 300 foot, and this is a 1500 square foot minor structure. I mean, it's, it's larger than most cottages on the beach. Um, through the environmentally critical zone. I mean, if you say it out loud, uh, it's very poignant. Uh, it's been denied twice and rightfully so. No matter how you want to obfuscate the matter, at its core, this special exception is an encroachment that helps no one but Mr. Rude and Mr. Kramer. Typically, our council strives for a community benefit of some sort, some silver lining to justify their decision in cases of variance requests. But in this case, you're doing exactly the opposite. You're actually eliminating and destroying a community benefit that currently all residents, Floridians, and visitors uh, appreciate with the approval of this special exception. That's the fact of the matter. As legislators, you're tasked with protecting our comprehensive plan and our LDC, our Land Development Code, and is intended, quote, to prevent public harm by precluding the use of land for purposes for which it's unsuited in its natural state and which injures the rights of others or otherwise adversely affects a defined public interest. You know, the EC zone that is currently at risk is not a featureless beach as we see further north on the, on the island where all we have is sand. This portion of the EC zone is a rich, pristine habitat providing beautiful native vegetation and critical nesting and foraging for threatened shorebird species. The, um, in, your, in your judgments, uh, I must say, um, I didn't find anything that I could hang my hat on. Uh, Mr. King, you uh, actually were, were just looking to put this behind you. Uh, and I was hoping for more information on how it actually does meet our land development code. Um, Councilman uh, Woodson, you had uh, rightfully said, uh, there are times when the, lot, uh, the LPA and staff do not agree, so I asked why do we even have an LPA? And we have to uh, use our advisory boards. I will say this, although I was here asking to meet with the, the Marine Environmental Resource Task Force in February to readjourn our meetings, we did not get back together until April, uh, conveniently after uh, this variance. Uh, Mr. Allers, uh, Mayor Allers, you know, you had uh, talked about your judgment, and that was that uh, the bridge is not within the critical wildlife area boundaries. You know, this really has nothing to do with the critical wildlife area at all. This is about the environmentally critical zone that runs the full length of the beach and serves as a buffer to protect our beach. And to put a structure in that area is, uh, is not right and it's not fair. 
So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Steve. Okay. okay. The first public comment is from Joe Puglisi and Carol Sudo Puglisi. Excuse me if I misspelled or mispronounced that. Um, in reference to the walkover, the council just approved the homeowner knew about the lack of beach access before he purchased the home. I had looked at several properties in the same area and did not buy them because of that. His goal is to increase the value of the property he bought. That home was purchased at a discount because of the wildlife area and the lack of beach access. The town needs to rescind its approval for the walkover. The Audubon Society has huge resources that the town does not have. As taxpayers, we will be forced to pay for one man's attempt to increase his property value. With the new beach firm, approval will allow every beachfront owner to install their own walkovers. The town cannot approve for one property owner and not for others. The council needs to revisit this vote to protect the town from further legal costs. The next one is from Penny Jarrett. Um, just as a reminder, it's awfully long. I'll set the timer for three minutes and stop at three. What, you're gonna you're gonna gong yourself. I'm gonna gong myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hello, I am submitting this email and ask that it be read at the June 5th, 2023 Town Council meeting. The special exception for Rood and Kramer's 298-foot dune walkover should never have been approved by a Town Council 3-2 to two vote. The Town is now being sued by Florida Audubon, and rightly so, for the Council's failure to consider the negative, life-threatening impact to the resident resident and wintering shorebirds. One, the 298 foot structure is a football field in length, crosses over two lagoons and is not a dune walkover. Rude, Kramer and their attorney have misrepresented what will be built. Two, taken from the FMB special exception application, whether the request will protect, conserve or preserve environmentally critical areas and natural resources Natural resources does not include shorebirds. This structure located along a critical wildlife area and in the town's EC zone will environmentally degrade and fragment important shorebird nesting, feeding, and resting habitat. One can simply spend a few hours, as I have done many times in this area, to see threatened least terns nesting nearby, threatened snowy plovers feeding in the rack line, Wilson plovers on a nest right where this structure would be built, black skimmers skimming the lagoons to catch an evening meal, or reddish egrets, snowy egrets, great egrets, green herons, white ibis, and roseate spoonbills foraging in the lagoons. Three, new shorebird population data analysis show North American shorebird populations have declined as much as 50% due to habitat loss, degradation, and alteration. The installation of Rudin Kramer's walkover will degrade the alter and degrade all uh, uh, degrade and alter shorebird habitat. Audubon knows this from scientific research and why the organization truly committed to bird conservation is suing the town. Four, friends, neighbors, myself, and the community at large has been severely impacted from Hurricane Ian. Why, when so many residents who have been displaced and are working tirelessly to restore, rebuild their homes have Rude and Kramer's special exception application and permit to build a bridge to the beach been given undue consideration. Why did Karen Woodson bring up the permit for Rood and Kramer at a prior town council meeting suggesting that it was for some reason vitally important? Why, why, why? Five, instead of only financially benefiting two property owners by allowing them to build a private walkover on state lands, town council should maximize the island's economic recovery by highlighting the shorebird rich area and tapping into the multi-billion dollar ecotourism market of which birding is a huge part. Okay, uh, the next one is from Gail Crabtree Pergoli. On September 28, 2022, Hurricane Ian roared onto our island. It took our innocents, our homes, and our friends. Our newly elected and current town council and staff stepped up and took charge in the face of this challenge. Many decisions were made and continue to be made that were unprecedented on our island. We remain in uncharted territory. Permits are scarce, staff is absent, tempers are frayed. Our island life as we knew it is forever changed. Two taxpayers have dominated our island culture for many years. 
They have fought for years to build a 298 foot structure adjacent to the Little Estero Island Critical Wildlife Area. This is a protected area, an environmentally critical area on the south end of our island. They have not succeeded in obtaining our town council's approval until now. Two of our newly elected town councilors, John King and Karen Woodson, have made it their mission to support this structure. They contend that these taxpayers have the right to access the beach. These councilors contend that this structure is the exclusive right of the taxpayers. Despite the rejection of two other town councils, this structure was approved. In the midst of the continued tragedy of Ian, the scarcity of town resources, the inability of islanders to obtain town permits to rebuild their homes, our town council gave permission to these two individuals to build a large structure on our island. While many islanders struggle to rebuild, these two taxpayers have been granted exclusive approval to enhance their property values. This matter is far from over. Let your voice be heard. This bridge approval is wrong for our island. We have an opportunity to extend harmony and respect to all islanders. Let us act now. I'm gonna wake my computer back up. The next email is from Gloria Abramoff. This has all been said before, but I'm begging you to listen. Do not be responsible for degrading and possibly destroying a critical wildlife area to satisfy the greed and petulance of town homeowners who did not purchase homes with direct beach access, but believe they are entitled to it anyway. The shorebird population is struggling from loss of habitat. We are blessed to have endangered least terns and snowy plovers along with black skimmers and Wilson plovers breeding in the south end of Fort Myers Beach. Please use your authority responsibly to act as guardians for the wildlife and what is left of the natural beauty of this fragile island. The next one is from Leslie Frick. We'd like to thank the town council for their tireless work on behalf of us citizens, both pre and post Ian. Please le read our letter at the June 5th town council meeting. We've been impressed by the extensive conversations and careful decision making that generally goes on at LPA and town council meetings, considering the benefits for the majority of residents and guests of, on the island. This has not happened in this special exception granted to Rude and Kramer for their dune walkover a boardwalk access through two lagoons and into a critical wildlife area, the nesting area of several threatened species. That structure and the traffic of their renters and guests will have a negative effect on our nesting shorebirds, a, a population already in decline before Ian struck our island. Beaches and shorelines change naturally as well as a result of people imposing structures onto them. Having walked the beach on the south end of the island since 1989, we observed how the shifting sands and tides have created and then filled in tide pools. Just north of our Bay Beach Lane access is the Leonardo Arms. Preserving the beach and the buildings there seems a sensible project, but we're bracing ourselves for the effects <coughs> its rescue will have on the rest of the beach. The shoreline there will change due to the Gulf's interaction with the new seawall. Will that seawall serve up to partition the beach and curb the walks of our community? One of the most wonderful features of our barrier island has been the opportunity to walk the entire beach without interruption. As with the Leonardo Arm seawall, the proposed lagoon walkover would alter this. Considering the way that southern shoreline has shifted over the last several years, it is not at all inconceivable that the boardwalk into the critical wildlife area will similar, similarly partition the beach it seeks to access. At the very least, the structure will alter both the lagoons and the critical wildlife area it targets. Although the council has devoted itself to the preservation of the richness that is Fort Myers Beach, it's sad that their approval of the boardwalk deliberately imposes a threat to the wildlife our beach supports. The council's decision favored by moneyed interest by inviting them to move right out into the natural resource that is the beach. The council chose to support the real estate investors at the expense of the environment that attracted those investors in the first place. Today, the council has another chance to do the right thing for nature. 
please reconsider allowing their infringement on an area that has long provided for the birds. We urge the council to think of the good of the majority of the residents and guests of Fort Myers Beach and protect their ability to walk the beach and enjoy viewing a healthy, protected, rare bird population. I have two more. The next one is from Mary Louise Bauman. My name is Mary Louise Bauman. I am a permanent resident on Fort Myers Beach. I am also the president of the Sterile Islander Garden Club. I have been following the controversy concerning the dunes walkover since its beginning. As individuals and as a society, we are all responsible to do our small part to preserve our planet. We on FMB have been blessed with the exceptional responsibility of co-inhabitating a beautiful barrier island home to exquisite birds, fascinating mammals, bountiful fish. If it flies, walks, or swims, we have it. The area where the walkover is designated to be built has been a nature preserve for years and should remain so. To disrupt that area in order that a few houses have a closer access to the beach is putting the convenience of a few over the needs and responsibilities of all. Ian has changed the beach and the mangroves and the lagoons. Ian has changed a lot about FMB, but not the fact that we take our environmental responsibilities seriously. <clears throat> we will never be recovered until the birds are back, the fish are plentiful, and the natural Florida landscape has grown back and gone wild. I applaud the Audubon Society for taking a firm stand and encourage the council to oppose this also. Florida is famous for its open public beaches and FMB has the best beach in Florida. Let us not set a precedent by allow this footbridge across the mangroves and the dunes of our beach. Thank you, Mary Louise Bran ba Bauman. One more. This one is from Susan Patton. I am Susan Patton from Bay Beach Lane. I would like to talk today from a bigger viewpoint than just one person or one group. We all know on Fort Myers Beach that there is a changing climate. Ian has taught us that. Things are changing constantly and we never really know when things will be different. We are all trying to do our small part to maybe decrease this climate change. For instance, we are all recycling. I know that in my own household, my husband is very keenly aware of recycling. We even have to take the empty toilet paper roll instead of just throwing it in the bucket beside the toilet. No, we have to put it in the recycling bin. It is very easy for me to buy a plastic gallon of milk cheaper, but I have chosen to do my little part by buying two half gallons in the wax covered paper cartons. This is just my little part of doing something for climate change. At EBIA, we are trying to, after the hurricane, to plant with environmentally friendly plants. It would be much easier and cheaper just to throw grass down, but we are really thinking about the environment, how we can encourage the birds and the bees and other wildlife so that the circle of life hopefully will be continued for the next generation. Climate change is a huge issue and it becomes overwhelming if you think of it as a whole. We can only do our little part, but with each person doing their little part, we can achieve success. I think back to when I was in grade school and Lady Bird Johnson decided to clean up the highways and she had a huge campaign to clean up highways. I remember that it was then unaccept unacceptable to throw trash out my car window or to throw trash on the ground, but to find a bin to throw trash in. Through everyone doing their small part, we changed the complete outlook of the United States through Lady Bird Johnson's campaign to clean up America. I believe that the world can change the climate if we all just do our little part. Today, I think about my family that we're talking about today. I think about how lucky they are sitting on their back porch or deck. Please think of yourself sitting on that deck right now with your beer, Prosecco, wine, or whatever you like to drink on a hot day. We can all see the ocean. What a view, but we have an extra gift. We can actually see a bird sanctuary undisturbed by humans or anyone else right in front of us. How fortunate we are, we can actually see rose spoonbills and other beautiful birds without any disturbance from any human structure. Wow, maybe coffee in the morning on the deck would be grand also. What a gift they, what, what a gift what they have been giving, a blessing 
blessing that very few people in Southwest Florida have. Bird sanctuaries on the beach are very few. By this family just giving a small part for climate change, they are giving the world a huge benefit to climate change. The birds and the bees will complete their continue complete or continue their circle of life for the next generation. I know this is a lot to ask, but this family, but the payback is immense. Yeah, could you wrap it up, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> I was done. <laughs> I had one more line. <laughs> That's all I have. That's all you have? Yeah. Anyone else choose to speak in public comment that didn't put in a card? Seeing no one, we'll close public comment. Local achievements and recognition. Vice Mayor Idaho. Uh, nothing uh, this morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Veach. Yeah, I'd like to just thank Adam um, for coming out here and talking to us and the support of all the legislators. Um, it's been vital and it will continue to be. So thanks thanks for coming out and thanks for keeping us in your in your thoughts, prayers, and budget. <laughs> and not necessarily in that order. <laughs> 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 Councilor Woodson. Yeah, I just want to comment on uh, the continued reopening of different businesses on the beach. Um, I just saw that the pool just opened um, up at the Pink Shell. Um, Yucatan opened their regular restaurant, not just outside on the deck and that type of thing. And I know there's continued, there's going to be more changes and more changes, but I just applaud everyone who keeps working so hard to get the beach back. Thank you, Councilor Payne. Uh, I'd like to recognize and congratulate Don Hanyo on his retirement after 20 plus years working for the town of Fort Myers Beach. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet him last week as well as um, several other town employees. And I want I got the opportunity to thank Don for his service to our town. So congratulations. Thank you, sir. You stole the words right out of my mouth. Uh, happy retirement, Don. Next, we need to have a motion. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the town council meeting of May 15th? So moved. Is that a motion? Is there a second? I'll second uh, with one edit. Um, on page two, John King said it was um, it was my birthday. Um, I've, I'm well past the age where I'm trying to accelerate my birthday, so I think that was meant for maybe Councilman council or Vice Mayor Adderholt. Duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to restate it for the vice mayor? I think he was napping. <laughs> I just, it was, it was not my birthday. I thought it was your birthday recently. And, and um, I think in the minutes, it, the mistake John King was saying it was my birthday. Could have been Councillor Woodson's, but I think you and I are pretty close. I yeah. think I recognize both right. of you. But. Well, happy early or belated birthday to everyone. <laughs> we, got, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, hearing none. Motion carries unanimously. That brings us to our consent agenda. The first item was pulled by Councilor Veach, Farmers Market. Councilor Veach? Okay, yeah, I was looking at the proposal. I, I do, you know, I enjoy, enjoy having the Farmers Market. They're a good thing. I'm just kind of questioning under the bridge um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the parking revenue, but the other is that in the state of things now, I wonder if we could consider putting the Farmers Market in Times Square. Um, to bring people to Times Square. Um, right now, it's a it's probably one time when that would work. When there's a lot of um, there's a lot of space that's not being used there, and uh, and make it more of an attraction for downtown instead of under the bridge. Well, I guess I don't. They would know probably best. I don't know how much revenue we're actually generating under the bridge is if anybody Jason would you have any of that information? probably not I, I think we do have that information I believe Danielle has that information it's, it's in the packet I think what it said was the loss was going to be a little over one hundred eighteen thousand dollars for the uh, entire run so I think it's 52 oh, weeks yeah I, I believe uh, the base team has got an estimate let me confirm that number though it's on the base team. And I don't want to. I, I don't know about the space, and 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 if this if it's something that uh, Linda would consider, but uh, right now it seems like you know, making Times Square more of a bringing the event Times Square would be beneficial to our businesses. It would be a higher profile for the farmers market, and um, we wouldn't lose the parking revenue. The only issue I would have with that suggestion is the Jason. Do you as we're moving forward with doing the infrastructure, would this 
potentially then get in the way. I mean, I know they're going to be working. It's not going to happen overnight. I just would fear that it would get in the way of, of that project being done if we had it any time still. Would well, they be working on Saturday, right? Isn't this just Saturday? Or? Well, it's not so much that they'd be working. It's just the things would probably yeah, be roped true. off and closed yeah. off and open hole potentially. Right. That'd be my, my objection to that part of it. But uh, is Linda still here? I can't see. Do you want to come up here for a minute, Linda? Just to answer a couple questions just in case. Um, well, <laughs> I think Councilor Veach had a specific question about would you be opening, open to relocating somewhere other than directly under the bridge um, for sure. revenue reasons? Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much revenue you guys actually need right now. I know it's probably not making any money during those hours. Um, well, we need all the revenue we can get. Okay. But, right. okay. <laughs> um, well, and I, I don't know if you think it works for you, Linda, but it seems like having the farmer's market right in the center of town. Yeah. Um, it's already kind of got a farmer's market feel to it with some of the things that are going on. If we could Certainly open to it. And, uh, you know, just would like to walk it off with somebody that, I mean, all of you or talk, you know, have a meeting with you all, whatever. Uh, I haven't actually put my boots on the ground over there to see the actual space other than, you know, with the Chamber of Commerce trailer. And, uh, so certainly would be willing to discuss it. Could, could I ask a question, Linda? Uh, I love the fact that you're thinking about farmers markets. Um, to Councillor Veach's point, it is more high profile, but there's also restrooms there. Were, were, were you yeah. going to import restrooms as yes. part of the, okay. But if you could utilize the ones in Times Square. Yes, that would be great. Especially as we slow down and obviously we'll have less tourists. So then obviously the, the restrooms would probably accommodate uh, the farmer's market. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by the idea, Councillor Veach, and uh, I think it's worth it. To, to the mayor's point, obviously, we'd have to work around construction as it progresses through Times Square infrastructure construction, not necessarily buildings, because they're, they're, they're doing the water and sewer lines and, and so forth. Um, but it seems like there's enough room there that you might be able to adapt. And, yeah, and it's move. a great idea. We had tried speaking to several property owners all around Times Square and got just literally got nowhere. But I think the town owns a significant yeah. portion of Times Square mm -hmm. where that might that we might have some more flexibility. And I'm just not sure about how much space that is. Well, yeah. But potentially I, I we could certainly potentially we could do a hybrid sort of thing. We could do it in Times Square until we start the renovation, and maybe that'd buy us some time to work with the county about potentially moving it into Lynn Hall Park um, parking lot, since they are not charging for parking anyway. It's obviously not a revenue thing for them. Um, it'd give us time to at least maybe talk to them and see if that's something they'd be open to. Or you could always go back to your plan of going back under the bridge mm -hmm. if, if you'd be open to that idea. Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually a wonderful idea to do something with that great visibility down there. And and then once you have it down established, then you could move it under the bridge or, or like you said, to Lynn Hill Park. Have you approached the county at all about potentially? I have in the past, and I've gotten absolutely zero response. Well, we'd be certainly but willing with to you guys you. behind it i mean it would i'm sure i would they'd have to respond you know another option could possibly be if we have a, a lot of construction at any given time bayside park will be open before anything in Times square or anything like that so you know if it kind of flexed between the two depending on is that by snug harbor yes yeah. okay the way they built that is prohibitive for tents and okay. path. Uh, they just built it where you just cannot fit. Now, I don't know if it's gonna get completely cleared off and redone or what, but uh, the way it was built last year was completely prohibitive for any kind of a 10 by 10 tent. Okay, I think it's gonna probably be put back similar to what it is <clears throat> right now. Yeah, so. I would love that if it was completely cleared off and have a stage right there for a band. I mean, we could mm -hmm. totally uh, use that space, but. Um, it's just prohibitive the, with the structures and the, and the landscaping. Okay, so with the interest of moving forward, um, would the council be, council Linda be willing to maybe table this for a meeting and allow you to go and, and maybe work with staff, look at Times yeah. Square, see if it's appropriate? That would be great. And uh, just how do I follow up with staff about that? Or which staff? We, I think we have your contact information so we can reach You'll out to you. Me? Sure. Yeah, I think we want to make sure that there's enough room down there. And then, like the mayor said, once uh, construction does start, we'll probably have to relocate them. 
Okay. Um, and then great. just for the record too, I, know, I saw the financial impact from base. They did put in there that they're estimating mm -hmm. about 65 spaces for seven hours a day, uh, $2,275 per day, 52 days. Uh, so they're estimating a, a loss of revenue of about $118,000. Yeah, and when we're talking about um, 9 a.m. to 1 being the, the operational hours, and then an, an hour to set up, maybe an hour to close, um, and those aren't like the primo uh, hours of each time. But those, but in fairness, Linda, those are those are places that the town, if for people who purchase a parking pass, they mm -hmm. can park for free down there, and then they can come to the farmers market at Times Square. So it could be a win-win sure. uh, for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. If you're okay with that, we'll, we'll table this for now. Have you work with Jason and, and staff, okay. and and I'll reach out to the county and see if that's something that they would be interested in filling in if we had to move you. Okay. Out of time square Thank you, Bill, for the suggestion. I just have, uh, I guess, a concern or a, a need of further understanding. You're wanting to start on July 8th, right? We are flexible, and in fact, we were thinking about postponing it a little bit. Okay. Well, so, then. yeah, we we have time. Okay, then that alleviates my concern. Thank you. Yeah, thank so, you guys. John, do we need a motion to table that? Then I'll make a motion that we table the uh, item A and the consent agenda for the next town council meeting. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries unanimously. Item B is resolution 23-52, heavy equipment purchase. John, you pulled this? Go yeah, ahead. I just wanted to have uh, help the public understand the cost and who's paying for this. Sure, so as part of our TDC budget approved for last year, uh, the town did put in a request to replace our tractor. Uh, we also did get some insurance money from the tractor uh, that was left here on the island. Uh, so the, the plan would be to use that $56,933 first from the insurance and then use the remaining uh, amount from the TDC budget uh, to cover that. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve resolution 23-52 heavy equipment purchase? So moved. Got a motion, is there a second? I'll second. Got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries unanimously. Next is the uh, consent agenda item C, authorize the town manager to approve Coastal Engineering Consultants, Inc., SBA number four for contract RFQ-21-09-EN dash 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 to monitor shorebird nesting for the emergency berm product project. John, you pulled this one as well? Yep. Um, I just want to understand, is this expense ours or is this FEMA reimbursable? Eliza, can you, is that something you can help with or Chad? So the STA is specifically you for identify the- yourself. Oh, Eliza Supriana, I work with Tidal Basin, supporting the town in the PA recovery. So that STA is specifically for um, monitoring of the beach berm and that is reimbursable. We'll add it into the project and get reimbursed for that. When we use the term monitoring, is this is this monitoring for the, the nesting birds that are in the critical wildlife area? Yes, it's part of um, the EHP condition. So anything related to environmental and historic preservation, just ensuring that you guys are within compliance. Very good. Was Thank this you. a competitive bid process or? Yes, I believe so. Yes, Chad's nodding his head yet. <laughs> I could hear it over here. <laughs> also, and I suppose Chad will have to address this. Um, what experience does Coastal Engineering have as a bird monitor? Thanks, Eliza. Hey, morning, Chad Schutz, environmental staff. Um, so they are hiring FWC approved bird monitors, so they've been approved by FWC. Right. Thank you. And uh, to your question, they're monitoring the, the berm alignment, not necessarily CWA. There's no berm in the CWA. So Chad, since you're up here, and uh, I happened to ride my bike up and down the uh, island the other day on the beach, uh, the berm, the uh, the emergency berm is spectacular uh, where, it, where it's in place. Can you talk, I saw some numbers, I think, from uh, from our PIO, Jenny, the other day, talked about the tonnage of sand that's already been placed on the beach. Would you, would you just run through it, give everybody a little update on how, I think we've had some pretty dramatic 
uh, progress on the emergency berm. Do you want to talk a little bit about it, tell the story? Sure. Uh, so uh, about 116,000 of the 124,000 tons has come to the island. That might still be in the staging area or out on the beach. Most of it is out on the beach. 15,000 uh, linear shoreline feet of the approximately 20,000 of the entire project has been placed. Um, we are uh, having some um, delays associated with the shorebirds and the nesting. So we're Putting that on pause down there until shorebird nesting activity is done. And just to clarify, this is this is this was uh, financed through federal funds. Is that correct? This particular phase of the renourishment. Uh, the emergency berm is financed via FEMA, yes, sir. And that's a seven million dollar uh, allocation, roughly. More or less, yes, sir. And then and then the 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 areas that uh, that have not received the emergency berm. I know it's not directly related to the CWA, but many of those areas are in the CWA. We're, we're, we're reserving the right to, for those who want it, to, to install that berm after the nesting birds are done, correct? Uh, yes, sir. We're going to work with our um, partners at the Department of Emergency Management and FEMA to uh, get that um, I don't know, suspension or extension of the contract um, approved so that we can still have those funds available to build it down there. And this berm, the, the emergency berm, for those who haven't been out to the beach, runs almost contiguously from, certainly from Newton Park, almost down to Lonnie Kai, and you have literally a wall, it's not a wall, but it's a mound of sand. Not only is it been helpful for the turtles, but obviously if we have a storm surge, a modest one, uh, with as we enter hurricane season, this this could have a huge protective benefit to the island. Is that fair? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, even um, during this last full full moon, um, high tide, I think you're seeing that that berm's providing lateral access without getting your feet wet. So um, it's definitely going to provide some shoreline protection. Well, your your, animatus, your animation this morning, Chad, is overwhelming. I, 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 I thought you were more enthusiastic about the project. Yeah. I'm, the more, I'm very enthusiastic about it, so I think they've done a great job. I think when I ran into you on the on the shoreline, the, the, the head of the of the company who was doing the stand was there as well, and it, it, I just I thought it looked tremendous. And, it, and that's... I forgot my coffee this morning. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Yes, sir. Councilor King, you have any other questions? I'll move to approve. You got a motion? Is there a second? Second. You got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Hearing none. Motion carries unanimously. Next, we have item B, RFQ-20-22-AD, STA number eight. That was pulled by Councillor Woodson. Yeah, I just want to understand, and I think Andy might have more information on this, um, about the actual positions that are involved and um, if we need all of those folks, if we need to, um, prioritize, reprioritize, that type of thing. But I know Andy would have more involvement in this and I would just like for him to be here. So to move it to the next, <clears throat> excuse me, the next meeting when our town manager is here. And my, my understanding is these, this is still a contract basis. So we, mm -hmm. we use them as we need them. So it isn't like we have extra feet needs. No, I understand that. But it's, it's the two, you know, and I know, I know Sarah, as well, and Jason Smalley, but I think there's some other people involved behind the scenes. Well, I think Jason Green and and Sarah are the main from that, um, and they're they're kind of our senior planners, the high end planner to do the presentations right. and work with the code change, which I think is a is a it's a critical function right now. There's a lot of uncertainty there, and uncertainty is um, really destroys progress. No, I, I absolutely agree on you know Sarah and and Jason Smalley. I just think there's Jason Green. I'm, not Jason Smalley. I'm sorry. <laughs> I absolutely agree with having Sarah because. Pardon? Sure, that would be great. Good morning. Sorry. Uh, Sarah Probst, Community Development. Uh, so it's primarily. Uh, Jason Green and myself that are handling some of the higher level projects. Uh, we also have um, a 
sort of a younger planner. She's not a beginner, but mm -hmm. uh, she receives the lower rate and she is doing a lot of staff reports right now. So she's doing a lot of the behind the scenes background work, uh, researching, and uh, that way there's just enough staff to handle everything that's coming through right now. So we're not doing more than we need to, we're only taking on what's assigned. Okay. Uh, and she also handles some of the GIS work. So it was my understanding, um, and this goes back to when Keith was here, that Jason Green no longer comes to the meetings, but he's still work doing work for us. I thought Jason Green was out of the mix completely. Um, he still works. I mean, the contract is for Axis Infrastructure. That's our company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's me and Jason and one other planner. Um, he assists. He answers questions. He's got a lot of background information, and he can handle some of the questions that if I'm too busy. Um, he sort of just has a lot of background knowledge from the time that we've worked here in the past. Um, he would be available to attend meetings and assist with staff reports and documenting. He does review staff reports uh, as well as myself. Um, he can attend, but he doesn't have to. And I'll just say I've dealt with uh, Jason Green a lot and, and Sarah, but I've talked to Jason a lot. He's very knowledgeable. He's been in the business for a while. Um, he really and he understands our codes. I think this is a valuable asset to have going forward, particularly when we are where we are now, where we really have a lot of work to do in that area. Any other questions for Sarah? Okay, Sarah. Thank you. Did you get the answers that you were seeking? I, it, no. It, it, well, it appears are you. It, it appears to me that you're maybe looking at potentially trying to find a different company. Is that what you're leaning towards? Or? Not so much a different company, um, as much as a different mix. Okay. Well, I, I'll tell you that you know I was I was disappointed when um, Jason Green just kind of without any any knowledge to me stopped coming to the meetings and I actually asked uh, the town manager at the time I asked um, and uh, the the after a while they came back and said they felt that Jason Green had lost the confidence of the council due to the Eddie Rood boardwalk project which um, as someone on council the question never come to me I think Jason Green's I, I, I believe that we have our subject matter experts and we have to listen to what they say because none of us are qualified to the level of these experts. And if they say something you don't agree with, getting rid of them, I think is just um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a bad road to go down because you know if your doctor tells you you should you know lower your cholesterol, you don't just go find another doctor. No, and I understand that. I just there's part of me that you know I'm not negating what kind of history. Jason Green has or anything like that. What I do see is um, in a lot of cases just in his approach to things is just a very uh, much of a lack of the direction that we're going to through with the culture that we're trying to change to. Um, I think he can be, uh, and, and the reason I, my understanding with Keith anyway is the reason he was uh, taking out of presentations was because he, you know, there were a couple of times where he addressed the LPA that was totally, totally inappropriate. Um, and I watched those meetings, and that was part of the reason for having him not come to meetings. I'm not saying that he doesn't have experience. I'm not saying that he doesn't have um, the history with us, but I'm just saying the attitude um, does not match where we want going forward. And I would just argue that this culture you say that we are doing has never been vented in front of the council, never been discussed. I think that um, that we all have different opinions about where we should go. And if, if there's if there's if we are if we are creating a culture it should be defined and discussed. Well and I think that is in the works with our mission and values that we brought up, I think it was either last meeting or maybe, the, well, I think it was the last meeting and that Andy was going to start um, putting some pieces together on that. We, we haven't seen it yet for approval. We haven't seen or we haven't had the input on it. Um, I think it might be coming up on an m and I'm just not sure. 
Okay, Council Woodson, you pulled this agenda item. Do you have a motion? I would like to propose that we move this to our June 20th, 20, 20th meeting, 21st. I can't remember 20. when the next meeting is. 20. 20th when Andy is back, when our town manager is back here. Okay. I'll second. We got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Now, just, just for clarification, I know that Andy's not here, is it? Um, this approving this appropriation does not necessarily cement us to any particular mix of people in the time. It's just to continue the contract and continue to pay the people for the work they're doing. I just have a question for mm -hmm. our interim town manager, uh, Jason. If we don't approve this today, is there enough funding in the pipeline to uh, to allow this uh, these services to be uh, rendered until our next meeting? Uh, we'll confirm with the current SBA how much is the remainder on that, and then I'll let you know by the end of the meeting. Joe, Joe's here. Is that something you okay. can answer, Joe? Joe or Steve? You can't be answered. Well, we certainly don't want them not getting paid. No, not yeah, we can we can check them what the remainder of that STA is. Please do. And, and Please. Sarah, are you aware? No. Okay, so you want to just just, just, we're just for the a rock in a hard place here. Well, maybe. We, well, we've got a motion in a second, so we'll we'll, we'll can we'll, just yeah, go ahead. I think Sarah has the information that you're asking for. Um, I'm under the impression that we're we're out of money with the STA. It was supposed to be on last month's agenda, and we missed the deadline because we didn't understand that that we didn't understand the uh, agenda schedule, so it didn't make it on the last agenda. So yes, we have exceeded our current funding. Would so the, I'm sorry. I'm just going to ask the author of the motion. Would the author of the motion be open to an amendment to at least allow uh, for the next two weeks to continue to pay the contract until we can make an executive decision on the contract itself? Absolutely. I, I, then I, I would amend the motion as follows. Okay. With the seconder? Yes. Okay. We've got an amended motion and an amended second. Any more discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. The motion carries four to one with Councilor Veach dissenting. Brings us to public hearing. The first is Ordinance 23-08, Parallelogram Lot Setbacks. Final reading and public hearing on proposed Ordinance 23-08, entitled An Ordinance of the Town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 34, Article 2, Division 6, adding Sections 34-269, Parallelogram Lot Setbacks, and Associated Definitions in Chapter 34, Article 1, Section 34-2, Definitions, providing for, providing for severability codification, Scrivener's errors, conflicts of law, and an effective date. Sarah? Good morning, Sarah Prost with Community Development. Um, this morning, we are talking about parallelogram lots. Uh, total on the island, there are about 150 of these lots. Uh, the front and back property lines and the side property lines are both parallel to each other. However, the side, side property lines are not um, perpendicular. So that creates an odd building area on these lots. Uh, a builder on the island requested that we look into this to allow these homes to be rebuilt in a way that they previously in a way that they previously were. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. Oh, there we go. Okay. Did I? Um, this is a diagram that shows kind of how these work and how the code change would allow the um, rectangular homes to be built on a non-rectangular lot. Um, the new code would allow up to eight feet encroachment in the front with one side and eight feet of encroachment to the rear along one side. Um, and that compensatory side would not be allowed to be built in. So it, they would be required to build rectangular homes. This would help a lot of uh, property owners who are trying to build non-custom homes right now so that they can get back on the island. Um, along with this, we deleted two definitions um, because they were, uh, they were based on when the lots were de developed 
um, as opposed to actually how they should be measured. Um, so we've changed uh, how lot width is measured. Um, there may be a minor modification to this in the future, uh, just for cl clarification. The current staff understands what this code is intended to do. However, for future staff, we may make uh, a minor modification to the language. Um, it was something that just I realized last week. Uh, we also added a definition for pa parallelogram lots, so it's clear which lots these apply to. Um, this new section is proposed uh, right after administrative setback variances in the land development code, and it would include this diagram so that it's easy for, for the user to understand how this uh, ordinance applies to these specific types of lots. Um, the basically how it would work is the front setback to 25 feet and the rear setback to 20 feet would be measured from to from the midpoint of the lot to the midpoint of the house um and then the uh encroachment would be on either side of that uh can you just touch before you go on yes the part you kind of forgot there not to exceed eight feet Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, not they're they're not allowed to extend any further into eight than eight feet. And based on the angles of all the lots that I looked at on the island, there shouldn't be any instance where they need more than eight feet in order to get a rectangular house that meets that twenty five foot at the front. So uh, that appeared to be the maximum that anybody would need. Um, the proposed modification doesn't reduce the set or oh uh, this this is about the um, side setbacks which we are going to touch on later the side setbacks are not being affected by this code because uh, we didn't want to apply a special side setback to this shape of lot so um, a little bit later in the meeting we're going to discuss side setbacks for lots less than 50 feet wide but that is not included in this code section um, Oh, and I apologize. This was the presentation for last time. You've already set a second hearing date. So today, I just need you to let me know if you're comfortable with the language that's in your packet and if you have any questions and then um, approve or deny or recommend changes. Thank you. Any questions for Sarah? Council Reed? Okay, Sarah. So this is this is really with, with this change, there's no really total net intrusion into the setback because you're you're further back in some places and you're further ahead in the other it's yes. just front and back right yes any other questions for sarah i, I, I see uh, uh representative safford here but yeah the, the this did pass the lpa unanimously correct yes thank you Council king anything nothing Council wilson i'm good thanks thanks sarah thank you Mr. Mayor, yes, sir. For the record, uh, this is actually um, uh, second and final reading, uh, and therefore, in accordance with the code, and let you know that it's been properly advertised and properly before you. Um, the clerk has that information, so this would be if you vote to approve it, it would uh, go into effect uh, upon adoption. Okay, thank you. Do we want to do that for every single one or every, well, I, every single public hearing? The, the, well, technically, the code says that I'm supposed to now. Said it's been properly advertised. Mayor Allers, aye. Council Woodson, aye. Council Reed, aye. Motion carries unanimously. Next is public hearing item B, Ordinance 23 10, Old Seaport CPD and MC, MCP Amendment. This is the first reading and public hearing on proposed Ordinance 23 10 entitled An Ordinance to the Town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, replacing the Town of Fort Myers Beach 
resolution number 17-39 and amending the area for consumption on press premises in the master concept plan for the commercial plan development zoning for the property located at 645 Old San Carlos Boulevard, Fort Myers Beach, providing for revisions to conditions of approval and other clarifications as necessary, providing for conflicts of law, scrivener's errors, severability, and providing for an effective date. We'll now open this up to the first public hearing. Sarah? Good morning, Sarah Probst of Community <laughs> Development. Um, the applicant for 645 Old San Carlos, known as Old Seaport, Jim Figueroa, is requesting an amendment to the existing commercial plan development to allow for an expansion of the restaurant seating and alcohol service area, as well as amendments to the master concept plan. The CPD was approved through re resolution 17-39. Sarah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yes. but just for the public who might be watching, what is the name of the restaurant currently? Snug Harbor. Snug Harbor, sorry. Just, just for folks who are watching. Yes. Thank you. Yep. I, ap I apologize. The, the project is Old Seaport, so I was that's what I had in my mind. It's okay. So it's, it's for uh, Snug Harbor restaurant. Um, the proposed changes include an expansion of the area for consumption on premises for a 14 by 65 foot seating area of the Butler Act parcel, the dock, which will include a non structural shade element a seven and a half foot by 29 foot walkway between the waiting area and the dining area, an approximate 210 square foot rail seating area that will remain uncovered, and a proposed 25 by 25 foot chicky hut. The total area for the expansion of COP is 3,451 square feet. The master concept amendment also includes the addition of a proposed covered walkway from the parking lot to the existing covered dock seating area, and the construction of a covered eight by 10 foot hostess station with signage. The existing CPD includes conditions which will remain in effect and will extend to the proposed new area of consumption on premises. If this request is approved, there are no proposed changes to the list of allowed uses. The applicant is here and staff is available to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Sarah? Not, yes. This is this particular item, since it's the only one on the item, is quasi-judicial, site-specific. So okay. um, if we could swear in uh, Sarah and anyone else who's going to speak, if you could stand, raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, so um, you know, the testimony provided by uh, uh, Ms. Post is under oath at this point. Okay. Thank you, John. Don't have questions yet, but we may. Okay. Thank you. Mana. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Figueredo, and uh, from Old Seaport Place, which is uh, Snug Harbor. Um, you know, we're uh, we're here to make some changes that are good for everybody. Um, our clientele is the forty to eighty year old, and uh, one of the issues we had even before the hurricane is during the rainy season. Um, you know, when it starts pouring, it's kind of a pretty good walk uh, to the restaurant. So we wanted to, you know, uh, apply for a covered walkway. Um, and then when it does pour, it really limits our area on where we can uh, serve our people. So we wanted to increase that area. Um, also wanted to do a small little um, uh, hostess stand. So when people come in, we can kind of direct them a lot of people come in and, you know, a little bit confused on where to go. Um, and, you know, pretty much that's about it. I'm here to answer any questions. And uh, Is there going to be any kind of railing on this walkway or is it going to be just open? Um, on the actual walkway, it was going to be open, but right. I, I don't have a problem putting a, a rail in if you guys, if that's important, you guys. No, I actually was not important. I was hoping that you were going to say that. Okay. I just thought, you know. <laughs> People, you know, kind of defeats the purpose if you got to get out of the rain to right. either jump a railing or run around. Exactly. And then the same with the, that cheeky hut there or anything along, I'm assuming along the water, though, you might have some sort yeah, of. Yeah, along the water, we're going to have a rail so you could sit here and look out over the water. And then are you, it doesn't look like you're going to cover the majority of that wood deck that's out there now beside between the, the food yeah, preparation. Yeah, um, that wood deck is uh, DP lease. So the requirements for that is we can have shade up there, but we're not allowed to cover it. Okay. Any other questions? 
I, I think it's a, a great proposal. <clears throat> and forgive me for asking this, but I'm just I'm just always curious. Uh, and obviously, it's still at the proposal phase. But if the, the Moss Marine a Marina proposal for the the, the, the the Bayside Walk all the way over to Bayside Park, obviously that impacts your property and potentially what you're doing here today. With, is, is there a possibility to mesh those two even with these improvements? Yeah, we've been uh, talking to Ben on that. And once he gets a final, you know, what he wants to do, um, obviously as a business person, we want to help all of the businesses to make that downtown so awesome uh, for all of us. And um, uh, so we're, you know, we want to do whatever we can to make that whole Bayfront awesome for the whole community. That's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thanks, sir. We'll open it up for public comment. Is there anyone that chooses to speak in public comment? Seeing none, we'll close public comment, bring it back to the council for discussion. Is there a motion to move this to the second reading on June 20th, 2023 at 9 a.m.? So, so moved. moved. Oh, sorry, Karen. So I'll second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Um, I do have some kind of questions about this. Uh, now, this property, like every property on the water, there's a setback, right, between the water and construction. So would this be would, would this be a construction in that setback? I I do not have the plans in front of me. Um, the setback would not necessarily apply because of because it will be part of the master concept plan. Um, so a CPD they sort of create that's one of the benefits of creating a CPD is you design your own setbacks to work with the project that you're wanting. Um, I would, I can get back to you on that. I don't have the plans in front of me to tell you. I don't believe that the Chicky is within that rear setback. I believe it's further up from that, uh, from the water than that. And the other coverings were non-structural. So our standard um, setback it, it, without a CPD would be what twenty feet from the water. I believe so. It uh, that area would be the downtown district, and I believe it's twenty feet there. Okay, and 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 so this area on the dock, it's it's. I guess maybe the question I, I should ask when you're up. So you said for the dock, you have a DEP lease, and are, you're allowed to do um, consumption on premises within that DEP lease. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Come back up. Come on. I need you to come up to the mic. Sorry, I'll, I should I'll have this for you. Sat down. I'll have Bill ask you that question again, so it's on the okay. record. Your answer is on the record. So you said that you're on your docks are in a DEP lease, a submerged land lease, right? And you're but, saying there's, that this is compatible with that lease. That's correct. Um, the pot that's there's only a small pot that's under DEP lease. Then we have Butler Rack that we own, but the actual DEP lease area we're not changing that at all. Okay. Okay. What? Well, oh, don't go. Could you stay up real quick? Because I'd be remiss if I didn't ask us, and we're always trying to learn about our history. H how did you get to the name Snug Harbor? And tell us a little bit about the history of what's been there before you. Well, um, uh, back in the 90s, what was the 80s, uh, there was a restaurant called Snug Harbor. And for the people that have been on the island a long time, I remember my wife and I bringing our children there. And then Hurricane Charlie uh, destroyed it. And then time went by, and we had the opportunity to buy it. We wanted to bring that restaurant back. And then um, uh, Nick and uh, Pete run it. And it's a great family operation, first class. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of, uh, you know, restaurant that everybody wants to bring their wife, their kids, their grandchildren, and we just want to keep that going. It is an amazing place to sit and have dinner or lunch with the views, or it's a beautiful place. So thanks, thank for, thanks for the history. Appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. Any other questions? We'll wait till you sit down. Then we'll ask him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's got his running shoes on. He's ready to pop back up, I can tell. <laughs> We've got a motion and a second to move this to the second and final reading for June 20th, 2023 at 9 a.m. Councilor King? Aye. Vice Mayor Adderholt? Aye. Mayor Allers? Aye. Councilor Woodson? Aye. Councilor Reed? I was assuming some, in <laughs> some discussion. But I guess it's already 34 votes, so I guess it's not much purpose. But I'll just state that I, you know, I, I appreciate the ambiance it'll bring, but I'm also concerned 
that it will inhibit both some views from the park of the water and um, any kind of plan of a, of a, of a boardwalk. But I'll, I'll vote aye. Motion carries unanimously. See you in a couple weeks. Next, we have item C, ordinance 23-11, set back to residential uses in non-residential districts. This is the first reading and public hearing on proposed ordinance 23-11, entitled an ordinance of the town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, amending chapter 34, article three, division five, subdivision two, downtown zoning district, section 34-674, building placement, providing for severability, codification, Scrivener's errors, conflicts of law, and an effective date. We'll now open the first public hearing. Sarah? Good morning, Sarah Probst with Community Development. Um, this code recommendation is before you um, because the LPIA asked staff to provide any code issues that we saw that would potentially inhibit development. Um, this is specifically applicable to the downtown zoning district. Um, currently, uh, in the R RC, RS, and RM zoning district, there is a 25 foot minimum street setback for um, those of the residential districts. So single family and uh, two family homes for the RS and RC and for multifamily in the RM. Uh, the downtown zoning district, however, requires that uh, buildings be built between zero and 10 feet from the property line. While this may be appropriate in some instances, it may not be appropriate in other instances, uh, so we brought this forward as a potential issue for people trying to redevelop their residential properties in the downtown zoning district. Um, this kind of shows how in certain places you can have a zero to 10 foot setback, uh, but most of the time that's when you have an alley to access the property because you wouldn't have room to, um, to park a car in front of it. So that's the biggest issue. Um, so the LPA, uh, when we brought this to them, they recommended that staff look for language that provides the maximum flexibility. The language that you have before you allows uh, a single family or two family residence to be built within zero and 25 feet of the property line. So the they could take advantage of that zero to 10 foot setback if they want to, if they wanted to build something that was close to the road and they were able to accommodate their parking in some way they can do that, but they aren't required to. So this would allow them to build what you see as a typical single family residence with a um, driveway in front of it to park cars if they choose to do that, or if they have another design in mind and they wanted to build all the way up to the road, they can do that also. Um, this would apply to the secondary streets on the, uh, on the beach side of Estero Boulevard. Um, that was primarily the area where we were seeing these residential lots uh, or lots being used in a residential manner in the downtown zoning district. Uh, so the proposed language allows this, this is showing just some examples, obviously, this is a very modern house, which we don't see a lot of, but you know, it would allow it to be, you know, a home to be built right up on the property line or further back as a more typical style. And uh, I'm asking that you provide your feedback on this code language and if, uh, and if you want to move it on to a second hearing to do that. Any questions for Sarah? Just by way of explanation, Sarah. So, so the LPA sort of gave you a sense of the LPA that they wanted to move in this direction, but they've not seen this language. Is that correct? They have seen this language. Um, when we brought it to them originally, they said that they wanted to have this maximum flexibility. I brought it back to them. We did Discussed it again. They have seen the zero to twenty-five, and they were they were um, they felt that that was appropriate. So, so the LP has seen this language, and they 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 they've supported it. I there have been so many meetings lately, but I do believe yes, this was brought to them. That's what I'm trying to understand too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I believe. So, um, so, so, if in a nutshell, well, you're basically saying instead of just these zero to ten foot, it'd be zero to twenty five foot. Is that only for residential, or is that for any
construction in the area. Okay. Councilor King, any questions? None for me. I have none as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Public comment? Is anyone here that chooses to speak in public comment? Seeing none, we'll close it and bring it back to the council for discussion. Any further discussion, Councilor Veith? Nope. Councilor Woodson? No. Vice Mayor Earhart? No. Councilor King? Good. Good. Councilor Payne? Is there, well, is there a motion? We gotta have a motion, sorry. I'll, I'll move to move this to the second reading on June 20th, 2023 at 9 a.m. Second. I have a motion and a second. John? Aye. Vice Mayor Earhart? Aye. Mayor Allers? Aye. Councilor Woodson? Aye. Councilor King? Or Councilor Veach? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Brings us to our final public hearing, item D, ordinance 23-12, amending side setbacks for lots less than 50 feet. First, re this is the first reading and public hearing. previous code language that was modified um, in 2019, I believe. Um, so the minimum use determination allows you to build back. What it really does is allows you to build back at least one single family structure. Um, and that's on a non-conforming lot. The administrative variance setback variance allows you to request uh, decreases in your setback, but that's based on, um, trying to think of how that language is written, um, because so I don't have it in front of me, but it, it would allow a decrease in setback with the approval of an administrative variance. What's the width, maximum width of a lot where it can be considered non-conforming because that's the, one of the criteria, right? The RC zoning district sizes are actually it's a 45 foot wide lot. So that would be a conforming lot still, but it would be fairly hard to build on. Okay, so this is, so then we're kind of narrowing it out. So this is a lot that's less than 50, but greater than 45. Um, no, because you don't automatically receive the decreased setback. You have to request the decreased setback. So this would actually change the, um, the the zoning regulation. So you would go from a seven and a half unless you were, unless you did the minimum use determination and then received an administrative variance for setbacks and requested this additional setback and have to meet different criteria. Uh, whereas this would 
allow any lots that were less than 50 feet to have this six and a half foot setback as opposed to the seven and a half, unless you do all these extra steps. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then there, so there's no and there's no uh, additional criteria in this. So it's not like the downstairs have to be completely open or anything to avoid massing with these <clears throat> tall structures now being closer together. No, and and that could be um, if if council was interested in pursuing that. Um, I mean, staff didn't have a suggestion for that. However, if that was something that that uh, council was interested in, we could certainly include something like that. Uh, the item that was requested from LPA was just to find a way to decrease these setbacks because some of these lots, when they get that narrow, are just difficult to build on. And I'll just I'll just kind of comment that you know, um, okay, if you have a forty-five foot wet lot, forty foot wide lot, and you have seven and a half foot setbacks on each side, it leaves you thirty feet to build. And I'm building a thirty foot wide house, so I don't really see that necessarily as a hardship. And I can understand that also. I do not have a big house either. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's certainly doable. It was just the request of the LPA based on um, some requests that came in and some concerns uh, with building back. Right. And with the minimum use determination changes it did, that took non-conforming lots that were not buildable and allowed people to build back what they had. This is, this is allowing people to build bigger houses. I don't know that it it made lots that weren't buildable. Um, buildability is very subjective. Mm. Um, it did allow some additional flexibility within certain uh, criteria. So it helped properties that were previously not buildable maybe be buildable. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Which plays into that revenue that we were talking about much, much earlier. If you have something that you could build back that you couldn't before, that helps build your tax base back up. Council Wilson? So just so I'm clear, so the six and a half foot setbacks, 50, 50 foot wide lot. Less than 50. Less than, yeah. less than 50 foot. So that would give you a minimum or a maximum build, I should say, of could be anywhere from like 36 or below, or 37 or below for the maximum width of the house. I would have to do math to figure that out. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Six and a half is 13, so 50 minus 13 is 37. Okay. So oh, we're yes. saying that that would be, so, so then the house would have to be 37 feet wide or less based yes. on if it's 45 feet minus 13, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, so in essence, what it's allowing people to do is have more flexibility to build back without coming to LPA or council on every individual basis and taking up that time and decision making. Or just choosing to build a smaller house. Or choosing, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm good with that. Vice Mayor Dahl. It uh, certainly seems like a reasonable accommodation to me. And I, I, as I remember correctly, it passed the LP unanimously. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Right, thank you. Council King? None for me. The only issues I had were, were, I saw Chief Worth was here, he left, but it sounds like you addressed that at the beginning, that they don't feel that this would be a life safety issue by short or allowing these houses to potentially be closer together. No, they were very concerned about the five foot setback, which was what we were originally pursuing. Um, and based on the fire code, they felt that it was very important that we would have additional fire flow testing to ensure that we had uh, the volume that was necessary. Uh, following that discussion, we made the uh, adjustment to six and a half feet. It seemed that they were comfortable with that. And we've been having conversations with the fire department regarding fire flow testing. Okay. And I know that watching the LPA hearing that uh, Steve had some concerns the, this alleviates his concerns yes uh the building code does not want anything to uh be less than 40 inches from the side property line uh so there would be there would have to have, if it was less than six and a half feet uh there would have to be mm -hmm. changes to the overhangs and then the materials and then also openings and the side of the building okay appreciate it thank mm -hmm. you sarah and, and so the six and a half feet setback, that is to the, the body of the building, not the overhang? Yes, that's correct. And they would be allowed the same overhang uh, allowed on all other structures. Which is what, you'd be two feet? Uh, I believe it's 36, 36 inches. inches yeah. All 
right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. We'll open it up for public comment. Yes, sir. Uh, hey there, how are you? Good morning. Uh, my name is Samir Malvia. I'm joined by my colleague, Ernie. Uh, we're with a builder called Homebound. Um, we've been on the island for about five months. We specialize in rebuilding homes after natural disasters. Uh, we're the original proposers of this, of this bill, of the people who made this proposal originally. So one point clar clarification real quick. We're talking about the effective lot width of less than 50 feet, correct? Okay, perfect. Um, so as you read in your packet, there's over 150 uh, lots that have a parallelogram shape, most on Fairweather and Miramar. Uh, given the angle of the lot lines, while they have a technical width of 50 feet, the effective buildable width is about 45 feet, simply because nobody builds a parallelogram shaped house. Um, so this is what drove the sort of conversation that we were having with the LPA and, and several residents on the island, um, is that if you were to apply the seven and a half foot setbacks uh, as, orig as, you know, as originally proposed for 50 foot lots, given the fact that these things have an effective lot width of 45 feet, uh, you're sort of down to a buildable footprint of only about 30 feet wide. Uh, when a normal shaped lot has a uh, buildable, buildable width of 35 feet wide. So it didn't really seem fair, number one. Uh, number two is we've done a survey of all the home builders on the island. Um, there's few, if any, semi-custom builders that have plans that are less than 32 foot wide. Um, in fact, 32 feet wide is widely considered a standard house plan. Uh, this would force residents to use one of the builders on the island or build custom. Um, as you can imagine, building a custom home is more expensive, takes longer to permit and build, uh, takes longer to permit and build. Um, furthermore, we believe the build homeowners should have a choice in who they build with, and changing the setbacks to these lots would not only benefit those customers that are building with homebound, but those customers that were to build with other builders on the island as well. Uh, lastly, and I think probably the most important is um, efficiency. If we don't find a way to provide re relief on these lots, uh, you'll hear at least 150 various applications for folks on this lot, these lots, um, and it's a waste of st staff, LPA, and council time. As much as I love coming and hanging out with you guys, I don't think we can see them every week. <laughs> Um, so we've worked with the LPA and staff to come up with a six and a half foot setback um, and would really appreciate your consideration and guidance on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Scott Safford, LPA, and I'm a resident at 189 Sable. Um, during the LPA, LPA process, we were actually considering a five foot setback. But, you know, talking to the fire department, I think we came up with a really good compromise at six and a half feet. Um, you know, we, our goal is to get people built that quickly and cost effectively. And I, I think six and a half gets us there. I think it's a good collaborative effort on, on everyone. So I, I, we really like that number. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Anyone else? Hearing none, we'll close public comment, and bring it back to the council. Any further discussion? Yeah, I, I, I disagree with some of the things that, that they said. Number one is, um, you know, there's, I know of dozens of these modular homes that are going in, and there's actually a Finnish company now that's coming into the area too, that's gonna be cranking these out in Georgia. Um, 30 foot is a pretty standard because you can fit 15 foot on the truck. That's two sections, you can go bigger if you want. Um, I'm choosing to go 30 feet, I find it's plenty wide. I think that I've, I've never heard this 32 foot being a standard width. Um, and I, I don't know the business model of, of homebound. I get the impression that they have um, a handful of plans and then they try not to re-engineer them. It's not a custom thing. So they don't have any plans in their quiver that's below 30 feet, but I think it's a buildable size. I have serious concerns that putting houses closer together, particularly when we're raising them up, that they're gonna look very close. So we're gonna be, it's gonna be one step towards kind of what people say is a bonita beachification of the town. There's gonna be less space, more massing, particularly if we allow those, the, the, uh, the downstairs to be closed in, then there's gonna be very little space, a lot, a lot of block there. Um, I would have some questions too about effective width because we went through and we changed setbacks for lots that are over 75, and now we'll have another setback for lots that are below 50, and so you get these steps. So it would mean that someone with a 50 foot wide lot has less buildable area than somebody with a 49 foot wide lot. Um, with these steps we have, we went away from the percentage. And I think that the more we do this, the more we slice it up, the more kind of complicated and opaque this, this, uh, this process uh, becomes. I appreciate helping, you know, keeping, um, keeping options available for people. But I think that the idea that we are going to change our code and we already spent staff time and council time to make it work for the plans of, of a particular builder, I don't think is the best use of our time. 
you want to come up and address his question? Do you want to ask him a question about the plans or no? Or is that not? Um, Am, am I correct that you, I think you, they stated before in a different meeting that. I mean, it's, it's certainly true, um, but I think to the, the, the builder that you're referring to, very familiar with them, they build a great product, but it's a modular product. And I think that forcing people that have these lots to build a modular home that is factory built is not necessarily in the best interest of the town. I think I, I, I'm not, the, the proposal on the table is not for people to just build a home back. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you, we, our smallest plan is 32 feet wide. This does benefit home back, but it benefits every single other builder on the island as well. And so my, I have the utmost respect for Affinity and the product that they put in the ground. It's a fantastic product, but I do think that home builders, that homeowners and people rebuilding on this island should have a choice amongst a series of builders. And that 32 foot wide lot, not only unlocks a choice of homebound, but it unlocks a choice of several other builders as well. Now, did you, and you stated, in, well, your company did, that the minimum, the smallest width plan that you have in your quiver is 32 feet. That is correct. And so, if you have a hundred and some odd people, it seems like it would be a good business decision to come up with a plan that fits those people to get that business as opposed to have us change our code. Uh, that, that, fair enough, but I do think that there's other builders on the island that have plans that, are, that start at 32 feet wide. And so 32 feet wide is a standard house plan width in our opinion. And like I said, I mean, it, so yes, so that while we could change our plans, I think 32 feet wide benefits a whole host of builders on the island, not just homebound. And, and frankly, you know, I go back to the original argument that if you have a 50 foot lot on Fairweather, you effectively have a 45 foot lot on Fairweather, which entitles them to some relief in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for him, I guess, before we walk away? Um, well, no, I, I do have a question for, um, for staff is that effective width now is that using it off the uh, off the right angle of the long the side property line is that what you're calling effective width or let me find the code that we just updated because we're getting to a pretty deep geometry here and and we're trying to not get into deep geometry because this has to be something staff is able to do. Um, so I apologize. The definition essentially measures the shortest distance between here and this. Okay. Uh, lot measurement width. And we didn't use effective width. We used lot width because that is what we're trying to measure. And I understand that the end is it it is the effective width, but everyone was basing their concept of the lot width on what it said at the street, which is not how staff would evaluate it. This just clarifies that. Um, so the lot width measurement is uh, the shortest distance between the side lot lines at the front setback line. When the side lot lines are not parallel, the lot width will be considered the average distance between the width measured at the front setback line and the rear setback line. One way uh, earlier when I said um, that there would probably be a modification to the code, I could see how this specific language could be misunderstood. Our current staff understands what the, the job is. Um, however, if you measured at the same angle as the street, you'd end up with the same width as the street. So it would have to be the from one um, from the front setback point on one side of the property to the shortest distance on the other side of the property. So that's probably how we're going to modify this. Um, so that is the effective distance, whatever the shortest distance between one lot line at the 25 foot setback and the closest lot line on the opposite side. Okay, I think I recall in the in the code that there's two sections, one's for older lots and one's for newer lots. Yes, and, and we've deleted that because it made no sense. <laughs> there's no reason that lots should be measured differently just because they were platted at different times. So we didn't think that that made any sense. Okay, so so now the only way to measure lot width is going to be go through the, the front setback line and measure the shortest. And if the lots are not parallel, then you're measuring the at the front setback and at the rear setback, and you're taking the mean between those because it was previously based on the front property line and the rear property line mean. 
And that didn't really make sense because that's not your building area. Your building area is between your front property line or your, your front setback and your rear setback. So essentially it's the shortest distance between at the front property line and the shortest distance at not at the front setback and the shortest distance at the rear setback. Okay. So you're basically taking the box of buildable space outline of the buildable space and saying the two sides of that is now what ever ever measuring that. Yes. And that assists lots that are oddly shaped so that you don't get pinged because you have a weirdly shaped lot that is wider at different points that doesn't help you actually build your house. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just I mean, one, one kind of potential concern with this is, you know, one of my mottos has always been in engineering is that everything should be as simple as possible and no simpler. And it seems like these, these setbacks are getting more complicated when we have, you know, different ways of measuring. We have outsized lots. We now have one rule for lots that are 50 or 75 and, and greater or greater than 75. And we'll have another one for 50 and less. So, so to that point, we did previously have the 15%. Um, the setbacks were set as 15% of the total lot width. Um, that was one way to ensure that everybody was impacted the same amount based on their lot size. Um, and one of the arguments in looking at if there were different points that we could set setbacks at was that if you have a lot between this size and this size, you have a bigger setback than people. It just ends up being unfair to certain size lots. Um, and I, I do agree, there doesn't seem to be a good way around that unless you do a percentage of the width of the lot. Uh, however, when we went through that process, uh, the percentage seemed to be a really big issue. Nobody wanted it, so we got rid of it. We went back to the system of between this, between this size and this size, you have this setback. Between this size and this size, you have this setback. Um, I don't know if it is uh, the best way to do it. However, staff does understand it, um, and it is workable, and that is how most communities do it. In regard to the lot width, um, this is actually much simpler than the other one because previously you had to look up the plat and figure out when it was platted, and then you had to look at the code and figure out like how you measure it. So now it's one way to measure it, and it is based on your buildable area. So it's fairer in that way. And so these changes in the definition, is that already done previously? Or that's that, was, that was associated with the parallelogram lots. Okay. All right. I, I do have a question for you real quick. Speaking of, since you were the ones that brought this forward, um, Bill has raised some concerns, rightfully so in my opinion, and some questions about, you know, you you have your 30 foot, 32 foot wide mm -hmm. model that you use. Are, are those models enclosed on the first floor or are they open? Uh, they, can, they can be either open or enclosed. So the way that we st structure our product offering is that it's designed to be you can add different components so you can there's different options because one of our goals is to make sure that we have a house for every budget on the island so obviously enclosing the garage uh, things like that adds cost so homeowners start our base plans all start with the bottom open um, and then they're built to obviously build 12 to 14 feet above grade and then they go from there um, there is an option for homeowners to enclose the garage downstairs if they like to uh, but that's not requisite part of our plans because obviously that adds cost and we want to make sure that it's more affordable for everybody and the ones that I'm assuming you probably have some contracts already out there for, for so, homes. So of the three that we've the three that we've got under contract, uh, two are enclosed in the bottom. One is not. Uh, speaking for our Fairweather customers, I believe, given how tight the lot is, um, they a lot of those customers will opt to keep it open just so visually it's a little bit it, so it takes up a little bit less of the lot. And visually, from a visual perspective, the lot will feel a little bit more spacious if it's open underneath and you can see to the back. Uh, but with that said, we don't restrict homeowners on that. If they want to choose to enclose the garage downstairs, they have the ability to do so. And do your models have uh, elevators in them, or is that another option? Each you... of those, all uh, each each of the homes is elevator ready. So the way we've engineered, so there's a, there's a shaft that's built in. If you opt for the elevator, it goes in when we construct the home. If you do not opt for the home, uh, for the elevator, the jo the floor joists in that closet are removable, so that you can put the elevator in later without any sort of significant demo cost. So we've tried to keep it flexible, mm -hmm. understanding that as these as this community ages, they may want to add the elevator 
now or they can add it now or if they want to you know add it in the future they would be able to do so without any significant sort of disruption to their home okay appreciate it thanks does that uh, give you any any relief phil and your concerns as far as imposing the lower level well you know I, I think that might be a reasonable compromise i you know I, I still kind of feel that uh you know you have a small lot you have a small house i mean it's not like you know if you pay for a small house that's what you're paying for a small lot that's what you're that's what you're paying for um and i think that you know i think it's reasonable to to go with the existing setback like i understand their plans i think that the other like another if they're really going to be putting 160 of these 160 of these units in that may require a variance for this. Um, it seems like a cheaper way to go instead of spending council time and staff time would be to just do the engineering to come up with a 30 foot plan or allow the six and a half foot setback. With, yeah, but then it seems either you're catering to a sure. builder. No, I um, no, I understand what you're saying yeah. and, and, and I get it. I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's people that are out there looking at purchasing property that's probably for sale. And, and basing their decisions on probably what we do here today here at the next meeting. But um, my biggest concern was the safety part of it. I did watch the LPA meeting and I know they went back and forth a lot with the five foot and they tried very hard to get the five foot. But uh, at the end, you know, fire and safety and, and our staff feels that the six and a half foot makes sense. It is a compromise. It's just a little bit bigger. But at the end of the day, if it, if it gets people back on the island that want to be back on the island, I think that's a, a, a very big proponent in my in my opinion to to allow this six and a half foot setback. But those are just my two cents. And Thank I you. and and I would also just you know, I just just to follow up what you said, I think that we really did that with the minimum use determination because those are people who could not get back onto the island. Um, I don't think this mm -hmm. is necessarily the case. This is just people having a bigger house and having more choices. But those choices could all be expanded by coming up with another model that fits in the in the uh, thirty foot frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I don't know that they're going to get all 160 50 foot lots, but <laughs> you, you never know. I guess if you're lucky, but Councilor Woodson, you have any questions? No, Samir, did you have more things to say? Sorry, when we came to the island, we did a survey of the lots, and our 32 foot wide plan fits on all of the 50 foot lots on this island, except for this, right? This is this is an a sort of site specific lot condition these lots are technically 50 feet wide so you can't until you get out there and see the angles of this it, it, mm -hmm. so our plan our 32 foot wide plan fits on all of the other 50 foot lines, lots on the island just not these ones because of the nature of the skew that's why we made this proposal okay i'm good Mayor i would just say uh I, I think this is a unique situation there's a finite number of these lots and I, I think there's something to be said in terms of the public interest to give people more choices. So I think this is a reasonable compromise and I would move, you want me to make a motion? Sure. I would I would move a pr approval of ordinance 23-12, amending side setbacks for lots less than 50 feet wide on first reading to be heard on next on June 20th. I'll next second. Town meeting. We've got a motion and a second. John, would you like to, you, you didn't get a chance to. I'm good, I'm ready to vote. Okay. Uh, and, and just since it, we're going to a second reading and I realize there's a motion on the table for that, but is there any interest in council to maybe having a requirement if you have the smaller setback that you have the bottom open? Well, I'm not opposed to the discussion. I don't I don't know that I would necessarily, that's why I asked about the elevator part of it because that's gonna have to be enclosed. And I know there's been discussions with staff and at least myself about you know how do you and I believe maybe in one of our public meetings we talked about it or an MMP meeting about is there some sort of formula that you could calculate that if you get something you have to leave so much of it open I don't remember exactly where that left but if if staff can work with everyone that's involved in this um, it's already been through the LPA but I don't know if there's a way to how do you regulate it I guess would be um, you would really have to direct staff on how you want that to be done. I mean, we can certainly include uh, a regulation that if you are uh, ha if you are seeking the six and a half foot setback as opposed to the seven and a half foot setback, that you have to leave a certain percentage of the um, first or the ground floor open um, or the entire ground floor open. Uh, however, then we would have to put something in there to disallow future development of that. Um, that's one of the issues with when somebody develops, they propose a building plan 
originally and we approved that then we would base it on the zoning review which would have to do with the setback somebody in the future might come in and want to enclose that uh there might be some confusion regarding whether they're allowed to enclose that um it's something that we could probably track we could probably track it um to ensure that there is a note in the system for all homes that have that six and a half foot setback so that they aren't allowed to enclose in the future. Um, and we could certainly do that if the council had a preference for that. So Bill, what is it that you would propose that you'd wanna see put in there? Well, I, I think everywhere, including in the B zone, there's always provisions for the ground floor um, being allowed to have access to close in, you know, put a door for stairs or an elevator and all that. Um, these are fairly small houses, so that's probably a pretty significant part of the downstairs. Um, but you know, if you you know you know how they have their storm winter area, and there are certainly areas where every house is gone. And in some of these parallelogram streets, um, like Coconut, and in some of those, every house is gone. So if every one of those houses is going to build up, close into downstairs, and have six and a half foot setbacks, it's going to be very dense. It's going to it's going to be like I said, the Bonita Beach location. And I think of the smaller scale of some of these. So some kind of concession for having smaller setbacks, I think, is useful for just the visual effect of having the massing of the houses closer together. You know, I, I guess I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I also want to, it's a fine line between getting too involved. And, you know, I certainly don't want someone that spends this kind of money to build a house, to tell them that they can't enclose their garage to protect their, their, their cars. But I also understand your point of, of wanting to keep it some of it open at least to help from that massing. What, what is the term are you calling it? Massing is something that I actually- No, the, no, the, the Bonita, the, the Bonita Beachification. The, okay, yeah. I that's, don't think you'll find that in the dictionary. Too many sil yeah, it's too many syllables for me. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I'm at it. And if this, is, this seems to be your idea, so I would, uh, we've got a motion, we've got a second. If, if you have something in mind, I think you can bring it up. We'll ask the, the motioner and seconder if, if uh, that's something they want to include in their motion or not. Well, this this is really just a heads up because you know we're gonna we're, we're we're talking about moving it on to the second hearing, which will happen. Um, but then if we if we do have instructions for staff, it's good to let them know now so that we can at least have the option available, the wording and the option available for the next meeting. Doesn't mean this has to be approved, but if we if we wait until the next meeting and then try to have the staff do something on the fly, it's it's going to be cumbersome. So you're simply asking to have staff try to come up with options, I guess, would be the best way to say it? I would say yes, that's a good characterization. Yeah, we'll go back. Is that something that uh, the council is comfortable with? Let's start with you, Councilor Woodson. No, I'll go back to what you said. I think that just puts more restrictions on people to build and more definition for us to be in the detail that I don't want to be. You know, I think, what, I think was it Sarah, someone mentioned that if you chose to use the six and a half foot that, or was it Bill? One of you guys mentioned that if you chose to use a six and a half foot setback, then these potential changes would have to be in, implemented. But if you use the seven and a half foot setback, then you wouldn't have to follow these. Is that kind of what Right, yeah, you could close it in if you, if you don't take this. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding what you were saying. Motion right out. Well, I, I, I would prefer, at least for first reading, to keep the motion the same. If, if, if there's ideas that want to be flushed out for second reading, we'll certainly obviously be open to those. But I, I, I'm concerned twofold. Number one, this made it through the LPA unanimously. This is a rather technical issue, and it, it involves, again, a finite number of properties, uh, and they're very unique properties. And, and again, uh, I, I think particularly for technical issues, I hope we don't get into a situation where we micromanage the LPA process. I think this is a nice fix that gives people additional choices. Uh, again, for first reading, I, I'd like to keep the motion the same, but again, if, if there's you know things that are brought before us for second reading that we, we would consider, I'd be happy to at least consider it, but I think at least for today, I'd like to keep the motion the same. Okay, Councilor King. I'm ready to go ahead and vote. Okay, go ahead. Aye. Vice Mayor Earhart. Aye. Mayor Allers, aye. Councilor Woodson? Aye. Councilor Beach? I'll vote yes to move in the second meeting, but I would ask maybe we'll just give the staff a heads up in case they want to come up with some language. Fair enough. Motion carries unanimously. 
Next, we have the administrative agenda, which there is nothing. So we will move on to final public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to speak at final public comment? Seeing none, we'll close final public comment. Town manager item. <laughs> interim, interim, interim. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a couple quick things. Wanted to echo uh, congratulations to Don Hanio on almost 20 years of service with the town. Uh, he, he worked for the Public Works Department for quite a while, so we, we thank him and wish him the best. Uh, just a quick reminder that June 1st brought on hurricane season for this year. Uh, about two weeks ago, we worked with our with Jenny on testing our Code Red system. Uh, so highly recommend that if you are not signed up for that emergency notification system, to please sign up uh, in preparation for not only uh, storm-related events, but any type of uh, emergency communications. Uh, that's our one of our many techniques that we can use to uh, communicate out there with the public. And then the last thing I think this was distributed out to everybody. Uh, I sat in with Andy last week. We had a great introductory meeting on this uh, trust for public land opportunity. Uh, it's we can work with y'all on on if this is something that we want to pursue, but we think it's a great opportunity uh, for land acquisitions uh, that can be done fairly quickly. Um, but also we think it's a great uh, opportunity to acquire um, some more lands to put into uh, public ownership. So if you have any questions on that, uh, just let me know. But we're hopefully looking to move forward pretty quickly with uh, this opportunity. Just uh, this is a great opportunity. I agree. Could, could you just give a little bit more information for those that are listening that may sure. not completely understand what it is you just said? Sure. So uh, it's uh, last week yeah, we met with the Trust for Public Land. It's uh, one of the opportunities that we have that helps uh, fund land acquisitions for property owners that may be up for sale. Um, it helps facilitate that process of uh, reaching out to homeowners, especially on the beachfront, um, as well as actually, it's, I don't think it's limited to just that, but anywhere on the island. Uh, it's just another way I know that we're looking into land acquisitions through uh, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, uh, as well as a couple opportunities. But this one helps facilitate not only reaching out to those, uh, those property owners, but also facilitating that process of acquiring the land, uh, getting fair market values, assessing all of that, and really guiding us through that whole process. So, And this could be utilized for pocket parks as well along the ocean? Along Correct, the yeah, we're, we're looking into the, the stipulations with it, but from what we understand, it just needs to be a public, uh, stay in public ownership, but uh, I don't think there's a lot of limitations on what to use it for. Seems like a great opportunity, given sure. the opportunity, uh, uh, given the tragedy for some pocket parks along, along the Gulf side, and, uh, and I assume Tidal Basin can help you with that, or are you gonna be using the new grant writer? I think we're open to using all the resources we have. Beautiful. <laughs> Good answer. Now, is this is this an is this an NGO or is it through um, a, a governmental agency? I see DEP down. I don't think it's a photo credit. Yeah, I believe it's a. Uh, I think an so. NGO. So then, Eliza. Um, so would that mean that this would not um, we wouldn't have the duplication of benefits problems if we like has had had hazard mitigation grant money that we could maybe use this as well you gotta come up <laughs> now you sit back there behind the post and you got a long walk <laughs> eliza cipriana again um so our team would have to look into <clears throat> excuse me the program um the like program guidance that jason was referring to just to make sure that there's no duplication of benefits Okay, because I think, you know, one other opportunity that, that, that there may be other, because I know I looked at a, um, a, a summary that was by that uh, R2P2 group mm -hmm. about what they did at Mexico Beach. And there was, I mean, there was money from all kinds of sources you wouldn't expect that you can combine together and do something. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing I think that may help is if, um, if we do acquire parks, particularly somewhere along a street or in the back bay, is we can also make a, a, a stormwater retention basin in those to help with our water quality before the water goes into the outflow, which would be beneficial. Yep, there's a ton of uh, funding through Resilient Florida for that. Right, and and you know maybe the DEP or other. Yep. If you if you do a water treatment option, it may open up additional funding sources as well. Yep. And I understand now. I don't know if you're that the uh, with the hazard mitigation grant. I know it's a little off topic here, but they in the uh, report that was sent out, you said that there's three property owners who are, have, have applied to have their land purchased? Correct. Through the hazard mitigation grant? 
Are you able to disclose any more about those properties? Are they? Are they? We could are provide. They in the process. <laughs> Not yet. So we're still in the application process of getting the funding for you guys. Um, but once that is awarded, then we'll be able to communicate with those property owners and get the process moving forward. So far, they just opted into being a part of the program. So is there with that, is there any contract or anything that they have to enter into for the mitigation money to be allocated for those properties or is it? There will be. Right now, it's just a voluntary phase. They're more than welcome to drop out at any time. Um, but once we do get closer, there will be an agreement that will be signed. Okay. All right. Okay. And now, um, before you leave, too, the, the hazard mitigation grant um, for lifting your house, that deadline has been extended. Is that right? Yes, until August. Until August now. So if anybody's listening and you're looking to either rebuild your house and you're willing to wait for this money, and or uh, you have a house you want to lift, that there is money available for that. You, it's a strictly voluntary application process at this point. Um, and the information is is uh, is out there, and uh, the deadline has been extended so we can get more people to sign up if you're if you fit that criteria. That's correct. Thanks, Liz. Thank of you. Course. Yeah. So Please. if uh, if we have consensus on that, we can start looking at identifying potential properties, uh, and then we can hopefully continue on with this process. I think it's a great idea. Any anybody have an objection to it? Concur. No objection. Is that correct? Yep, no objection. I think that's all I have. Okay. Town attorney items. John? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor and members of the council. The only item I have this morning uh, for you all is um, some email communications that I've had with, uh, as well as um, uh, phone conversations with many of you regarding the ongoing dispute uh, between the uh, Florida Audubon the town and uh, Mr. Wood and Mr. Kramer, and whether or not you wish for me to proceed with uh, forwarding to uh, Mr. Wood and Mr. Kramer the um, letter of indemnification or hold harmless agreement uh, that has been uh, going back and forth, which all of you have been copied on, including the most recent version where I made three additional. Um, revisions to, I believe, uh, provide additional um, protections to the town. Uh, with that said, as I've communicated to most, if not all of you at one point or another, or again in person or, or phone or by email, uh, it has been, it continues to be my uh, advice that uh, the pending appeal that has been filed by Florida Audubon to uh, allow it to run its course for any building permits that would uh, allow uh, the property owners to move forward with the construction, the dune walkover, um, that that process be completed, that appeal process be completed. Uh, there be um, no question that there's a, what is called a final non-appealable development order in place uh, before building permits are authorized. Um, the document that, that um, has been distributed would in fact allow that to happen pending the uh, disposition of the appeal. Um, as I said, I believe that um, entering into such agreement would uh, expose the town to uh, potential additional litigation. Uh, but again, um, the direction so far has been to complete that process, provide that document to um, uh, Mr. Root and Ms. Mr. Kramer, and uh, as I understand your direction, then staff would uh, follow through with the issuing of building permits to uh, the, the, the property owners to allow them to begin the construction of the uh, dune walkover. So I need direction. So I have some questions on that, John. So, so just to make sure I understand. So you're saying that typically you wait for a non-appealable judgment. Yes, sir. Before, or an agreement, I guess, right? No, uh, you don't, be there is no, if, if there's an appeal has been filed, you wait until the appeal is disposed of. Okay, and so by moving forward before then, then we put, we're, we're exposing ourselves to liability, and so this, this agreement between us and, and, and the other party is to try to protect ourselves from the right. negative ramifications. To minimize the, the, the possibility of additional litigation However, the point I'm trying to make is there's no way to guarantee 
that there won't be additional litigation and in my opinion unnecessary litigation um, if you just allow the appeal to follow to, to run its course now another another question is we had a good dozen or so people speak up at this meeting asking us to reconsider the um, the special exception uh, what is that an option that's available to us what, would that be something we'd have to go back to a shade meeting to talk about or was that um, would that just take consensus of council to reconsider uh, there is a process in the code uh, for the reconsideration of a uh, quasi-judicial item uh, generally would uh, have to be initiated by um, a council member who was on the prevailing side of the uh, of the vote okay to uh, motion the matter for reconsideration um, certainly if, if that's the direction of the uh, uh, the town council we can um, identify that section of the code provide it to all of you so we move forward in accordance with the, the requirements of the code okay thanks uh i've got a question john when you and i talked last friday um i had mentioned that the town had wanted this indemnification letter and i think you called it something like a i don't want to put words in your mouth but along the lines of a great fallacy that you had uh, wanted as orchestrated is that correct that, that, correct i think at one point in time there was a, a comment made that uh, i was the one that had initiated the the this um letter of indemnification and it, 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 that's not the case and at the last council meeting the direction was to move forward with it and that's what i've done so it's now um, um in my opinion as good as uh, it can be drafted uh, to provide the, the maximum uh, protection to the town as possible, again, given my prior comment. Um, and I do not know with, with, re with respect to the document, uh, particularly in light of the, the most recent changes, whether or not uh, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Rood will uh, find it acceptable. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't. Um, and if your direction is to move forward then we and, and finalize that's what that's what i'm asking for is that direction okay but just to continue um you when we talked you had said that it, you weren't the driving force behind this the town management was correct uh that is my a, a, as well as i presumptively mr uh kramer and mr root yes sir but you sent out you initiated two emails one on march 9th and one on april 18th where you uh, made it pretty clear that you wanted uh, us to, you in particular, to prepare and have uh, these defendants, uh, these uh, these folks, execute a disclaimer and indemnification letter. So I'm, I'm confused by that because you're saying the town management wanted, but you, you had initiated it with these two emails. Uh, I had those discussions, yes, sir. Uh, and it was the first one, if you check the date, was and maybe even the second one was prior to the appeal being filed, uh, which would have given that an opportunity or window. That's generally when such types of agreements uh, are executed is before an appeal is filed. Um, and in fact, the, uh, um, the document uh, that I used as a template for this particular one, which I believe I provided or circulated to um, uh, certainly to the, to the manager and to staff, uh, specifically says that if an appeal is filed, then the indemnification agreement is automatically becomes void. Uh, we don't have that language there because your direction was to move forward. It just seems to me, at least, that you weren't accurate in how it was portrayed to me. That, uh, I, that uh, certainly everyone is entitled to their opinion. I don't believe that the manager was accurate in his portrayal of my involvement in the discussion. So you're essentially, we'll just play from here. I hope you have anything to add to the discussion. Or I, don't have, I don't have anything to add because I'm, I'm not exactly sure where we're at in the discussion. All right, yeah. well, I was trying to, I believe where we're at is, is John is asking for direction on whether or not to execute the, uh, the letter. To forward it to Mr. Uh, Kramer and Mr. Rude's attorneys for them to review and advise their um, uh, their clients to whether or not they should execute it. And if they do, 
and they return it to us, then the next step would be to issue building permits. That would be a staff matter. So then this language that you were talking about that is not in there, but could be in there as far as it rescinds it, how does that, how do you? Well, so again, uh, generally speaking, a, 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 a permit, the a property owner uh, is willing to assume the risk to move forward be, uh, between the approval and the running of the uh, appeal period, which is a 30 days. But from a practical standpoint, um, because of how um, this concept called rendering, drafting of the resolution, et cetera, sometimes it can be longer, 45, you know, um, uh, 50, 60 days. And so in some instances, a property owner is willing to take the risk in that time period. The, uh, the uh, template, uh, which is actually from the city of, of Miami, uh, they have a very similar document, actually says in their form that the identification agreement becomes void if an appeal is filed during that, that before the, the, the appeal window, window is, uh, is finalized. Um, because the direction was to move forward and to potentially allow for the issuance of the building permits, that language has been deleted. I hope that makes sense. It clear as mud. Can I ask? A, can I speaking of mud? Can I ask a question, uh, Mr. Town Attorney? Can you help me understand? Because I, I thought you conveyed that uh, that that everyone is waiting on the judge to make some kind of a procedural. Uh, Declaration, for lack of a better term, yes. could you can you flush that out a little bit? Yes, there. I, again, um, I, I've been advised that there is a suggestion that somehow, uh, either myself individually or the town in general, um, are obstructing the process or the 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 uh, moving forward of this appeal uh, at the court level. Uh, as a general rule under the applicable rules of appellate procedure, which govern this particular type of appeal, the judge will review the appeal, make a determination that it meets the um, minimum requirements to proceed forward as a writ of certiori and issue what is called a rule to show cause. Upon the issuance of the rule sh to show cause, then the, 30, the, the timelines, the deadlines for the town, as well as the property owner and any other third party who seeks to intervene, then have their opportunity and their time frame in which to respond to the appeal. And that starts the clock um, running forward as it relates to us. As of today's date, the judge has not issued the rule to show cause. I do not know why. If you wish. Um, I can reach out to the judge through the judge's judicial assistant, uh, and I'll advise the other parties to the litigation that we're going to do so, because otherwise it would potentially be a prohibited ex parte communication. But as I said in the one of my emails, there's a, a risk associated with doing so, and potentially um, uh, the judge perceiving that we are trying to tell he or she how to do their job. I guess my question is is really timeline wise. So, if we're waiting for the judge to 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 issue this order or not order, but uh, this rule to show cause, rule to show cause, it's my understanding because of the fact that we're in turtle season right now, work cannot commence on the on the on the walkover until November first. Correct. That is my understanding. So, as we wait upon the judge to make a ruling. Uh, Assuming that the, the, the judge rules favor, well, he's not even really, the, the, he or she is not really making a ruling pro or con. They're just setting the procedural schedule. Is that in essence what they're doing? Yes, sir. And then once that procedural schedule is set, uh, given your uh, experience in these matters, how long before we get some sort of an indication as to which direction this is going to go? In other words, will it be before? November 1st, or could it be long after November 1st? Uh, it could be, I, I, I can't even venture a guess. So, but what I can say is that once the, the judge issues the rule to show cause, absent any of the parties asking for an extension of time, 
generally the time period in which we would have to file what's called our re, um, uh, answer brief or reply brief would be 30 days. How long the judge then takes to rule uh, and for the entire process to uh, be completed, uh, I've seen them be processed, uh, you know, ruled on very quickly, and then I've seen them languish for years. And I just give an example of the most recent one, which obviously included an appeal to the Second District Court of Appeal, uh, the Margaritaville matter, uh, which is procedurally virtually identical to what we have here. That uh, ended up going through the court system for close to three years before the project broke ground. So again, this is, 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 is lay people here uh, trying to understand the situation. If the Margarita folks would have decided to go forward with their development, they would have been doing so under the risk that the judge could have ruled against them and they would have had to then go back and make things in essence, the way they were before they started to build, correct? That is correct. And so I guess, uh, I guess my question- There's actually a case that says that's right. what you have to do. I got you. So I guess my question is who, who is assuming the risk here? In other words, is the town assuming the risk, risk or the applicants assuming the risk should they decide to move forward? Um, the, the, the applicants are, are assuming the risk. Uh, the, the idea or the uh, theory behind the um, letter of indemnification is that if, if, for example, Ford Audubon, which has already suggested uh, that they would potentially challenge such action on behalf of the, by, by the town to issue the building permits uh, before the appeal is done, and then we would have that litigation and the purpose of that um, letter of indemnification is to require um, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Rude to uh, shoulder the cost of the town defending itself in such a situation. That's an added issue. And that if in fact that does take place and if the judge issues a ruling adverse to them in the meantime, that they would then have to take the actions of having to remove that um, the whatever they've worked on so far, or even if they've completed the dune walkover. I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is if, if the letter of indemnification is done and signed and done appropriately, uh, it, 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 it reduces the risk for the town, A and B, should the Audubon Society be successful in the litigation, then the risk then shifts to the applicants. So I guess what I'm trying to understand in terms of the town's exposure, what is the what, what what's the risk to the town with moving forward with the letter of indemnification? Um, potential additional litigation. And, and explain that for me a little bit more. Um, Ford Audubon seeking an injunction uh, to the issuance of the permits, um, uh, even before the appeal is, is finalized, uh, potentially um, additional litigation on the back end if the, uh, by um, multiple parties, including Mr. Uh, Kramer, Mr. Rude, uh, if they lose the appeal and they've already moved forward with some of the construction, um, as I said in, in, in one of my prior correspondence to you all, uh, any of the parties involved, including additional third parties, could uh, initiate uh, additional litigation. Uh, whereas right now we have one piece of litigation, an appeal between, filed by Florida Audubon against the town and the property owner. Any other questions, Vice Mayor? No, thank you. So I guess what we'll we'll just go one by one and give John his direction on. I still have a question. Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought I already asked. I'm sorry. No. Um, so didn't you just say though, John, that through this letter of indemnification that you want to issue, that the responsibility then, if any other lawsuits take place or anything else, it's the responsibility of the homeowners um. to get their own litigation or get their own to, attorneys to pay for, for the town's attorneys but again um, the the it presumes that everyone agrees to comply with that document um, but if the, they sign it don't they have to comply with that document no ma'am 
um, just because you sign something does not necessarily mean that's called breach of contract. And then we end up in court suing them to enforce the terms and conditions of the indemnification agreement. Um, my point for this entire discussion is that this particular piece of property and this particular dispute has generated multiple uh, uh, pieces of litigation in state and federal court. And we've narrowed it down. We've gotten rid of all of the litigation except for one, which we do not have much, if any, control over both procedurally. Uh, ultimately, we will substantively it, it, when the judge move, it tells us to move forward. Uh, that's it. And, and you know, once that appeal is resolved, we'll have a much clearer picture, all the parties involved, on how to move forward and how to proceed. Uh, in the meantime, we're at risk. Any other questions, Council Wilson? No. Hey, you're leaning in. I'm leaning in. I'm just trying to get through all this legalese and trying to <laughs> trying to put it in the language that I understand. So, um, so if we Audubon Audubon has, has filed an appeal, so now it's considered the, I guess, um, it, it's it's still an open thing. It's not. It's kind of in mind. They're still it's still open. Correct. So we if we issue. We should build impairment. We're exposing ourselves, but then we're relying on the agreement and the um, and the other parties abiding by that agreement to protect us from the risk of issuing the permit. Seems like another another maybe less tangible part of that is that you know, like you said, judges are judges, and so they don't necessarily want to be told what to do. So if we go and prematurely um, issue a building permit while this is under appeal. Could that be looked at as a slap in the face of the judge or, or under undermining their authority? I, I can't speak for the judge, but it's possible. Uh, I, I, my 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 largest concern is already the fact that Fort Audubon has sent a letter to the town as well as to Mr. Um, uh, Kramer, Mr. Rude's attorney, saying, um, you know, uh, this matter's under appeal. Uh, we're just putting you on notice that if you elect to move forward with trying to build the uh, dune walkover before the appeal is over, you know, there's this case out there that says that you have to rip it out uh, and, and they may seek uh, an injunction to prohibit the town from issuing the building permits, notwithstanding the, the letter of indemnification. Um, and, and so look, to reset, there is no right to build the dune walkover until the special exception is final and non-appealable. It has been appealed. And now, it, could there be additional appeals? Sure. Yes, there's like, uh, what's like called Jameson what, and the, the current case, um, uh, the current appeal is what is uh, technically called first tier certiori, um, there is, which is um, a guaranteed uh, right to ask the circuit court, the Lee County Circuit Court, to review your administrative decision, depending upon um, how the, the court rules on that. Either party can then seek discretionary review uh, by the Second District Court of Appeal on what's called second tier writ of certiori. So we went through, what seems, it seems to be pretty obvious because it seems like the right to a speedy trial is more of an abstract. Instead of a real thing, because this thing can go, can really honestly drag on for years. And, and that's precisely what happened in the Margaritaville project. Uh, the uh, property, uh, the uh, neighbors appealed the, the, the decision uh, granting the right of Margaritaville to, to build the project. Um, it went to the circuit court. Uh, it was there for eight, nine months. I don't know the exact time frame. Um, the circuit court ruled in favor of the town in Margaritaville, and then the property owner uh, sought and was granted second tier cert certiori review at the second district court of appeal. That took another um, uh, year, year and a half, uh, part in part due to COVID. Uh, in fact, I first remember the oddity of appearing for the second, second district court of appeal by Zoom as opposed to in person. Um, so all, all said and told, I think that there was a, 
of course, a three-year delay in the in the actual construction of the Margarita Road project. John, if, if I might interject, Councilor Veach. It, it, John, are you comfortable with the changes that you've made to the letter of indemnification that it protects the interests of the town as best as possible? As best as possible, I can't guarantee that it, there won't be a, um, an additional does, litigation, though. And, does, and the point is that a letter of intent or a letter of indemnification, as attorneys are fond of saying, is only good as the piece of paper it's written on until you, if necessary, end up having to go to court to enforce it. And does the signing of the letter of indemnification obstruct in any way the Audubon's uh, uh, litigation? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how the Audubon would perceive it, uh, frankly, um, quite frankly. And so it's safe to say, too, um, given your, um, your, your less than wholehearted enthusiasm for the indemnification agreement, that the safest thing for the town to be would, would to not issue the building permit until this is played out in court, until it is actually non-appealable. That is correct. Are there any other questions for John? And what we're going to do is we're just going to go down the line and we'll, at, if you want him to send the letter, yes or no. Council, Council King? Yes. Vice Mayor Adderholt? Well, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say a couple of things before I give you a yes or no, if you don't mind. Just yeah, a, a couple of things. Number one, uh, I, I'm in a unique situation here in that I, I think the mayor and I, uh, we, we were elected at the same time. We, we've been in a unique situation for uh, a couple of years in the first couple of years of our service and that we were in the minority on a number of major issues. Uh, but we, we certainly stated our position respectfully and then we tried to not obstruct the will of the majority. And uh, it was challenging at times, Mr. Mayor, but we tried to do it respectfully and tactfully. Uh, and, and that's the situation I find myself in today. I, I in, in principle, I'm not supportive of, of this uh, walkover, but at the same time, I'm not, I don't want to obstruct the will of the majority procedurally. I just don't think it's the appropriate thing to do, but it's still time. I, I, I still want to represent the best interests of this town. And so, so the way I look at this is, is having the letter of an indemnity move forward does not obstruct the Audubon's uh, right to litigate this issue. Uh, it does help protect the town. And so, I, and, and I, at the same time, I think it also respects the will of the majority, but not in a way that uh, I think uh, unduly inhibits the Audubon from having their right to due process. So given those points, I, I, I would support signing the letter of indemnification. Council Woodson? I would say go ahead and sign it, send it. Here's your majority. You, we can go on if you want. <laughs> we have your I, 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 I will. Con I, I, I'm assuming I have my direction, and I will continue to keep the um, uh, uh, council posted and apprised of uh, the pro uh, how this proceeds. Uh, assuming that that Mr. Kramer, Mr. Root agree and sign it, um, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, but I would you know say I I, I appreciate what you say, uh, Vice Mayor Adderall. And um, I agree, even in our in our uh, policies and procedures, that once a decision made by council, that's now our official view, right? Um, but given that, right now we're at, we're, at, we're at another decision point, and that's what's best for the town now going forward, given the approval we have. And the two options are either don't issue the building permit until the appeal process is finished, or rely on this indemnification, indemnification agreement, but put ourselves at more risk. That, I think, is a question today. I don't disagree with that, Councillor Veach, and, and I think you can view it. Uh, uh, I think what was asked of us today is: is it in the best interest of the town to move forward with this letter of indemnification? That, that's, if I remember the question, that's what I think we were asked today, yeah. and that's what I'm offering my support. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm a big fan of issuing a permit uh, for this uh, doing walkover, but at the same time, I'm not. I'm not interested in obstructing the will of the majority. But but the letter of indemnification, and I understand, you know, it's a, it's a contract. But, but it is an enforceable contract, and it does protect the interests of the town. And I think that seems to be a, a reasonable step as we progress down this road. And again, if the Audubon Society is successful in the long run, it, it does not obstruct their ability to, to be successful in the long run, and, but at the same time potentially uh, uh, protects the interests of the town, at least from my, from my perspective. Yeah. And I, am, I, I completely I understand what you're saying. Um, I just think that we're, we are putting more risk on the town. That's by signing this opposed and just not issuing the permit until we we are allowed until there's an unappealable verdict. 
Yeah, you know that's an interesting question, and I, I, uh, I think, I think, uh, I, I, as much as I have respect for our town attorney, I think a dune walkover is a little different than a than a, a multi million dollar development. In other words, if we lose the case against the Audubon Society and they are successful, and in principle I agree with them, I'm not all for litigating against decisions that the majority of the council supports, but that's their right. Uh, uh, if we if we lose the case, the town loses the case, the dune walkover has to be removed. That's different than dissembling a multi-million dollar development. So I, I think from a risk standpoint, the risk is minimal to the town compared to Margaritaville uh, in that particular dynamic. So, but a fair point in, a, in an interesting discussion puts us uh, folks who are not in support of, of, of the walkover in an awkward situation. But I think that, I think signing the, the letter of uh, indem or indemnification is, is, a, is in the bench, is best interest of the town. I'm not sure that, that was a completely accurate statement. And I guess, John, I'd have to ask you to to step in here, but if the Audubon wins, this comes back to us, correct? It it comes back to the 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 town, but in again, timing wise, in the interim, there may be a, a court order that for Audubon seeks having the 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 dune walkover, whatever may have been built up to that point, to be removed. That's the ultimate purpose of their litigation is to have the dune walkover removed, correct? Is, is to have the Denied. special exception that authorizes the issuance of the building permits and the construction of the uh, dune, uh, the dune walkover to, to be reversed. That is the, their ultimate right. goal, but, but to if not success, have it built. If, if successful, or if the, if the, if the walkover is already built and then they're successful, then the remedy would be for them to remove the walkover. That is correct. I, I, that was my only point, John. Okay. I wasn't trying to. Hey, sure. it, yeah. it, to Council, Council Member Team's point, it will eventually come back to you. Well, um, that's right. That's fair. Um, that's and, fair. You know, and, and so it, it, you know, that's what I am trying to emphasize is that if it is, in fact, constructed in the interim, there's going to be more litigation other than just the appeal related to this matter. But I've received my direction. Um, I will move forward with that direction. Um, and again, we'll I'll keep you posted and we cross our fingers. Well, just for the record, because I didn't actually say anything, but you do have your direction. I was a proponent of getting the indemnification letter ready, which you have done, but that was not me saying send the letter. So You've prepared the letter. You've done what we've asked you to do. I, as I've stated before, believe that you know this is a process. You have to go through it. Um, my guess is just by sending it, there's no guarantee that they would sign it. Is that correct, John? That is correct as well. Or they could come back and say, we'll sign it under this stipulation that you issue the building permit today. Is that something that they could come back and say or do? Yeah. I mean, it, the what I would do is, subject to your direction, is to forward the finalized document to their attorneys, ask them to uh, you know, review it. Um, based upon the correspondence to date, I would not, it would not surprise me if they went ahead and signed the, the, the letter of indemnification. Which would then require us to issue the permit. Correct. So I would have, believe it or not, Jim, I would have. <laughs> I would have voted to not send the letter until we hear from the judge to see what his ruling is, but you have the majority uh, direction, so there you go. Um, somewhat as a, a as a second part to um, uh, this issue as we discussed, again, there has been um, what I understand to be a suggestion that I personally or the town attorney's office has been um, obstructing the uh, process of this appeal. Um, I want to make it absolutely clear, as I've said in, uh, already, that's not the case. However, again, you, I take my direction from the council. Do you want me to reach out to the judge and ask the judge, why haven't you issued the rule to show cause? Because Mr. Uh, Kramer and Mr. Rude's attorneys have not made that inquiry. I do not know why. Um, well, I personally don't feel any need to poke the bear. Oh, well, I don't know that it's our position to do that. I agree. I don't. It's not our position. Well, again, to then 
I, I, I only raise it because I understand there, this, this question has been raised. And I want to make it absolutely clear to you, my client, that I am no, in no way, shape, or form um, attempting to obstruct the, the, the proceeding of the appeal. And in fact, my communications with um, Mr. Kramer's and Mr. Rude's attorneys, as I've said before, is to, just as we did in similar cases in the past, uh, here and other places where I've been the legal counsel, is to coordinate and cooperate with the filing of the briefs um, uh, within the time frame set with, by, by the court. My job is to defend the actions of the majority of this commission, this council, and I will do so to the best of my abilities. And I'm good at what I do. Okay. Anything else? You got it, Sam? Got you on your mic? Nothing further, unless you all have any questions. Are you clear though? I mean, is yes. That, okay. Yeah, well, yes. So I, I, we will finalize the LOI. We'll just send it over to uh, Mr. Kramer's and Mr. Rude's attorneys. And we will and not we'll irritate the judge. And we will not do anything further. If they wish to, I'll let them know they're more than welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Council member items and reports. Mr. King? Well, uh, by unanimous consent, I was elected secretary of the Southwest Florida League of Cities, and I'm suggesting anybody that has the opportunity to have their election done by cons unanimous consent, that's the way to go. <laughs> um, Isn't that the way that elections in North Korea go? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I will take ex um, this executive committee office uh, position in August. It runs for one year. After that, I would uh, advance to the next higher position position until eventually reaching the presidency. Little engine that could. Big engine. <laughs> Anything else? That'll do it. Vice Mayor Idaho. Just uh, two items. Uh, I was asked prior to this meeting to see if the council would be willing to suspend the rules and allow for the Estero Island Small Business Group to have a dialogue with us at our next m and meeting, which I think has been moved to the 22nd. Is that correct? It correct. has been moved to the 22nd? Uh, they apparently have been uh, working on some ideas for how to help the mom and pops, for lack of a better term, uh, businesses on the island that seem to have uh, some indigenous support here uh, to, to, to prosper and maintain our mom and pops. And uh, obviously the m and format is somewhat awkward. It's more of a monologue than a dialogue. And, and they're asking for some time on our M&P calendar to have a dialogue with the council. Uh, I see our, 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 our representative, one of the representatives of this group, Mr. Safford uh, was here earlier, but he's not here. So I, I can't give you a lot more detail than that, but that's all I know at this point. But I just want to make sure everybody would be comfortable with that and procedurally suspend the rules to have that kind of a, a dialogue. We can put a time limit on however you want to do it, but I just, I was asked to, to ask that. I don't, I don't have an issue with it. I'd be okay with it. I can't be good. I'm okay. I'm just not going to, you know, I don't know if we're opening a door here because I don't know Scott, but I don't really know much about this association. I know that the, the chamber is established. We have a dialogue with them. Um, do we open up any other kind of ad hoc association that forms? I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, Councilor Veach, because that's a very good question. Uh, uh, I think it's at the council's discretion. Uh, and again, if people don't want to do it, that's fine. But I, I it seems like a... It, 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 it's a timely uh, matter, uh, and these are folks that are uh, directly impacted by the challenges uh, post Ian. Uh, and uh, it's a perspective that I don't think we've spent a lot of time. I don't think I think we've all been worried about it, but I don't think we've had a, a, a lot of focus on it. And this might be an opportunity to at least bounce some ideas back and <laughs> forth. I, I wish I knew more, Councillor Veach, but I, that's that's the extent of my knowledge on this at this point. And I agree in principle. The, uh, the second item I, I'd like to just run before my colleagues is uh, I had a meeting with the town manager uh, and uh, our PIO. Uh, I'm helping them. And I, I, maybe you all are being consulted on this on a communications plan. And, and, and this, in essence, uh, this piece of the puzzle uh, is really almost a, uh, a uh, uh, it, it's an action item more than a communications plan, but it, it'll dovetail nicely with communications. And and uh, 
this would be indicative of, of this would be an, a, an example of a culture change uh, that we were, we were talking about culture change. Uh, it's not the definition of the culture change, but it's an example. In other words, so one of the things that is you go up and down our island and it's going to be rough this summer and this fall for our businesses and our residents and, and the heat of the summer and things are slowing down and it's going to be tough. Uh, uh, and, but, but, but that being said, uh, as was mentioned before that we, we rode our bikes up and down the beach, but we also rode our bikes up and down the sidewalks from north to south uh, recently. And the sidewalks in the neighborhoods need some help. And uh, uh, I know the Estero Boulevard uh, property uh, is, and sidewalks is the responsibility of the county, but I, I don't think we as a town uh, can let that go much longer. I think we need to partner with our friends at the county and I've talked to Jason about this. I believe Jason was on the call as well. Jason, uh, uh, our, our interim town manager, uh, head of public works. My suggestion is, is that we, at a minimum, schedule a once a week uh, time, and, and we, we, would, we would divide the island into sectors or segments, sections, however you want to look at it. Start north or start south, however, whatever makes sense from the town staff perspective. And we would get, uh, we would have, I, I, for la because it's, I, I would suggest Tuesdays because uh, there's no, there's no recycle cans out, there's no garbage cans out, and it's a, it's a relatively calm day on the island. And I would suggest, for example, if we started up south, we started at the southern end, did four or five streets, and uh, we did a stereo boulevard primarily, but we would also take the, the town street sweeper and go into the neighborhoods with the street sweeper. We would announce this in advance so neighbors can come out and we could supply some brooms. Uh, we all remember the 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 the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the beach talk radio sweep. This would be really town sponsored, but certainly we would welcome uh, beach talk and, and the observer and anybody else who wanted to help publicize this. So we would have what in essence would be called, and forgive me for the term, but the only thing I could make sense with Tuesdays would be tidy up Tuesdays. And we would then go into our neighborhoods and in essence triage the neighborhood you would have a swarm of town staff. It would only be a Tuesday morning, maybe from nine to 12. We would have the street sweeper. We would have trucks. We would have shovels. We, so when, when the piles were swept into piles, they could be picked up immediately. The, uh, the, the uh, medians on Estero Boulevard are full of weeds. They need to be mowed. They need to be trimmed. It all needs to be swept up. Uh, yeah, the sidewalks are really uh, challenging, once again, aside from the structural challenges, but there is, there, and there, we know there's some large debris still on the sidewalks, but there's a ton of sand and filth and dirt and debris on the sidewalks. And I think just for, not only because that's our transportation artery, but I also think it's also, there's a, there's a it wears on people. Uh, and I think it's wearing people down because it's, it's getting rather depressing out there. And I think if we could, if we could do a section each Tuesday and move all the way down that island and give that island a nice deep clean, clean the volunteers who show up, not just from the neighborhood, people, what other people wanted to come and help, we could send them out to the beach part of that section, walk the beach, do the beach accesses if there's beach accesses in that section, and just really triage that neighborhood. And, and, and I think within three hours, if we have a group of 50 or 100 people, we could really make that look nice uh, and then move our way down the island and try to... Uh, not only repair the, the transportational uh, mode, but also uh, boost, the, boost the morale of the island. So I just wanted to, uh, the, the town manager suggested I run that by everybody. I can't imagine it would be something people would be against, but maybe you have some ideas that you'd want to add to that. Um, uh, but I, I think this is a way for not only the town, to, the, the town staff, because they're all there on Tuesdays. They, they, we didn't have a lot of town staff involvement or county involvement on Saturday when we did the sidewalk sweep. But if we did it on a Tuesday morning, we could get a ton of the staff out, not just the traditional staff, get the enforcement people out there, get the, the public works people out there. And if town council people wanted to sign up and be part of that, uh, depending on where the neighborhood is and what everybody's schedule is, that would be great. And just it seems like we all could work as a group, public, town, working together to kind of solve some of these challenges. I know it's a, I know that the streets are going to get messy again. I know there's debris still being worked on. But we can't, our island cannot look this run down as we go through this process. And if we could just give it a shot in the arm uh, throughout the summer and fall, and obviously once season starts again, we'll have a lot more traffic and a lot more people back and hopefully things will really start to get better. But anyways, I thought this might be a nice initiative over the summer and fall and just wanted to bounce it off everybody and get your input. I think it's a great idea. Sign me up. I, I would just, you know, I, 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 I was uh, reached out to by Keith Lee County Beautiful. They will they heard that after the storm we had a few weeks ago, there was a lot of garbage 
they had washed up and they were looking to do a cleanup down south. Um, their problem was they just have nowhere for volunteers to park down south because most of the condos, as you know, in our are fenced off construction zones. So it's not our places. But it seems like this may be a, a maybe be more appropriate to try to work this with keep Lee County beautiful, get more volunteers in, maybe less staff time, let our staff keep up with their permits and all the other stuff they had. Well, I, you know, that's a fair point, Council Beach. I don't want to. I don't want to be saying we're going to take the permit staff and put them out there. I'm talking about public works. Talking about you know base staff, our ambassadors on the beach. I'm talking about some administrative staff who just just the mornings to get them invested in our community, and then it allows the citizens in that in that neighborhood and quite frankly volunteers who might be visiting for everybody to be involved. And if 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 if, if our PIO does a nice job of publicizing this, and we get the folks on beach talk and others to follow this, then maybe maybe when we're doing a section that involves those condos, there's enough people involved. Where we could like I could get I could get my condo to open up its parking that day for people and that need to park in that area and we could publicize that in advance. It's a it's a very uh, it'll be labor intensive from a communications and organizing standpoint, but I think there's a will as we saw from the sidewalks uh, cleanup. There's a will for people to want to be part of something uh, bigger than themselves, but also the, the sense of, of of how nice the island looked after that just that sidewalks sweep was just one day. Uh, it could be it could be tremendous, and I hate to. I want to shift. I want to. I want the town involved. I don't want to shift it to a third party. I'd like to see the town staff be part of the effort and feel and let let them feel like they're having an impact. And and then again, have the neighbors interact with our own town staff. I did think about having somebody from permitting and maybe from our utilities be part of just have one person because if, if somebody in that neighborhood has a problem with their permit or inspection or or one of the utility issues, they could walk over and see their issue. They could ask questions. It's a way to almost have a, uh, and it, it's a way to get our town to interact with our with our residents in a way that's not just that it's the town going out proactively as opposed to waiting for people people to come down to the trailers and wait in line and do their thing. The town's going out to the neighborhoods and and having that it sends a message that we're we're working for the people and I think I think that's part of the culture shift that we're looking at if if I could be so bold. Yeah, but I would also you know just consider keep the kind of beautiful because I also have the reach. Yeah, no, no, they would be included. I think we could have our PIO involve them. And when we have organized Tuesdays and we have it all set up that we could get bring them in and, and have their volunteers be part of it. And absolutely, the more the merrier in terms of that. But I just want to make sure that the town's got some skin in the game and can help sort of be the core. Just because if it's a particular Tuesday where there's not a lot of volunteers or it's a part of the island doesn't have a lot of residents, we still have a core team of people going in there and triaging it and cleaning up our sidewalks. And, and getting that grass mowed on the median and just getting things looking nice, trimmed, and getting some debris off where we can. And maybe there's some, some debris we can pick up and pull off that's on the sidewalks. Uh, some of those cement uh, stones are, are obviously too big, but it just seems like we've got we to rally. What's that? Yeah. That's true, John. It puts you on the big chunks of cement. Uh, <laughs> but but I, uh, I, I just think that uh, it's, it's getting kind of grim down here, and it seems like if we made an effort, I think it would be well received. All right. Anything else? That's all I've got. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Woodson. I love that idea, Vice Mayor. Um, and in addition to that, I just wanted to bring up that there is a canal basin cleanup and a mound house cleanup this weekend. Um, this is in the water. It's being sponsored primarily by uh, the chamber in conjunction with Keep Lee County Beautiful. Um, but all like all around shipwreck and that canal that goes past Moss and back into the basin. So that's one area. And then the other area is back by the mound house and the um, canoe launching area and that type of thing. And so I think I'm pretty sure that the uh, chamber put out a notice today and looking for kayaks and boats and anyone that can help. I know Shipwreck is involved in putting out a uh, garbage container, a huge container container as we pull things out of the canals. So, you know, this would just be an enhancement for the rest of the summer too. I mean, this is just a one-off item that's been organized, but to keep go that going all summer, I think that would be huge. Um, you know, you talked about kind of the debris and everything just kind of bringing you down. I had the chance to go <clears throat> to the other coast this weekend, and I know 
there's so much conversation about we don't want to look like Miami, we don't want to look like the East Coast, all of that. However, I think there's some pieces of what has taken place on the East Coast that we could incorporate that is absolutely stunning, beautiful. Um, you know, obviously not the high rise condos and all of that's not what I'm referring to. But, you know, you go to Lauderdale by the sea. I mean, it is old school, it is restaurants, it is beach. Um, they do have parking garages, but they're covered up and they're, um, they're almost like designed to look like beautiful buildings. They have live walls everywhere with greenery and all kind of foliage around them and everything so that they don't stick out like a parking structure. Um, just about every one of their rooftops um, have all kind of greenery and palm trees and sitting areas. I mean, it's beautiful to look at. So you get the greenery from the street, you get the greenery from the rooftops, and it's there's elements of it that I think are absolutely beautiful that could be incorporated on a much smaller scale, could be something that could really help in our rebuild. Um, you know, it was deflating to come back <laughs> after seeing all this beautiful greenery and bright colors and all this kind of stuff, and then to drive back on the island. And it was it was hard. It was really hard. It hit me. It probably hit me harder last night than it has hit me in a long time, because I think I'm so used to just being around it. But when you get away and you can see how beautiful it can be again. And then to come back and it hits, it hits really hard. So I just want to bring that up. The last thing, I think I was quoted as saying, why have an LPA? I think Steve Johnson said that, that, you know, there was a time when I was on the LPA, um, that a lot of the decisions that we made were not taken as, as valued. Um, when it would go to council, they would be overturned. I saw the same thing when I was on BORCAD. And I think that this council has made um, a true, true effort to listen to our people. I think we have great people on the LPA. Um, I think we listen to them now. I think we take into consideration what staff says in those meetings, what the LPA decides, and we move forward. So I just wanted to clarify that that was um, a comment that was made in a prior council and a prior time when I was in a different position. And I think that has had um, tremendous movement forward, this council. So that's it. All right, anything else? Well, Councilor Beach? A couple things. Now, of course, we're back in hurricane season, which is probably too soon for most of us. Um, you know, now they, uh, it's no longer such a game. But uh, one thing that came up, I know that um, that you know the uh, when the when when the rescue people came through and, uh, and and knocked down a lot of knocked a lot of doors in, it created a lot of anxiety because now people's houses were exposed and they were worried about neighbors and whatever else. One thing that I did, I think it's effective that people may want to consider putting in the hurricane kit is come up with a sign that you can tape on your door that says, "No one's home. Don't break down door." And that, in my case, is enough where they did not break down the door of my uh, my little room over the garage. So I think when putting people are, and you should have your 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 go bag and be ready for another hurricane. A lot of a lot of places are very exposed, and that's one suggestion I have is just come up with a sign you can put on the door, and maybe they'll uh, they won't break down your door if you if you actually clear it out. Um, another thing that the with the resilient Lee, uh, they're going through now this next stage where they have the branches, which are the people who are trying to refine down the input for different categories, and they're calling them branches, they're working, and they're talking about resilient hubs. And this is kind of something that, you know, I think I proposed before with town council of trying to acquire some of the land around town hall, um, although it's, it's very, it's almost prohibitively expensive, around town hall, and then make a greater hub. So we would have um, a hardened town hall. It would be great to keep the fire station there. We'd also have Bay Oaks. We could potentially have alternate power sources with generators and things. So when, if they were after a storm like this, there could actually be a comfortable air-conditioned place for people to be. 
maybe not a shelter per se, but something uh, something to provide that service to people. Um, that's a kind of pushing the end of it through, but it's going to be it's going to be a hard sell. Um, another thing is, you know, we've been for the last two years we've been working on trying to update the comp plan. It doesn't necessarily mean change the comp plan. I think town council was pretty clear in our um, in our our expression that what they proposed about the changes in the comp plan were not, especially with densities and FARs, was not particularly wanted. But I think that I really I know that we're, we're talking about the you know the small business association. There's still there's still a lot of uncertainty out there, and I don't think we've we've made it enough of a priority to to try to answer that um, uncertainty. I know talking with uh, with Sarah and, and other planners is that first thing they say you should do is to top down. So update your comp plan. We're obligated to do that by state law periodically, and then go through the LDC, clean up all the conflicts because the things that we're doing now with um, with setbacks, there's been this kind of change has been going on for years. It creates kind of a bit of a disorganized LDC, which needs to be gone through. What I'd really like to see is, is the town give direction to staff to say, let's come up with a, an outline of how this is going to work. Let's come up with a schedule and let's start working through the process and then, then implement our commercial nodes so that the people who have that land, which I understand a lot of them are for sale but not moving because of uncertainty, is that we can start to give them clarity to allow them to rebuild. I'm certainly not opposed to that. Anyone else have any objections to it? No, I did, I've been saying this for a couple of months now that we need to move forward. I think this is a great end to put a timeline with it and to actually get an agenda going and a timeline. I think that'd be huge. And um, that's pretty much it. I'll just kind of reiterate that if any, if there are condos out there who can provide parking for Keep Lee County Beautiful, um, let me know or, or contact Keep Lee County Beautiful. And, uh, and, 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 you know, there's still volunteers out there who are ready and willing to help. And, uh, and at the beginning of the, the cleanup, they were, they were heroes. That's it. All right. Well, just to kind of piggyback, I think, on what both Vice Mayor said and you have said, I spoke with Greg, one of the owners of the beach bar yesterday, and I did not know about this, but evidently on Saturday there was a school or something that was out there cleaning up the beach. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, get, and and which I'm shocked I didn't know anything about it, but that's my problem. <laughs> um, that he was he, he got on me pretty good for not letting him know ahead of time because he would love to host things like that. He would like to put food out there for people that want to come down and volunteer. So if you are reaching out to keep the county beautiful, keep him in mind. He you know they don't open till later anyway, so most stuff is done in the morning. So anyone that's listening, um, reach out to Greg at the beach bar. He's willing to. To set up whatever he needs to set up to help he wants to be involved in the beach cleanup and that kind of thing so i told him i'd relay that message today at the meeting um, another quick thing um, is the i shouldn't say quick but kind of piggyback off of your idea vice mayor adderholt as i've been having an idea and, and talking with beach talk radio about trying to organize uh, you know i always think about first impression is is the most important right if you're buying a house whatever first impression is a sterile boulevard when you come over that bridge and seeing all the destruction takes away from what it used to look like so i think if there's something that we could do to organize with the maybe with the garden club or someone that has a much better green thumb than myself of how we can start replacing that greenery along estero boulevard making it you know we all remember when you drove up north north estero boulevard how beautiful it was with the trees and the, the bushes and you know so when you come over that bridge, it, it, it may be a small gesture, but it would be something that's very welcoming that says, you know, welcome back to Fort Myers Beach. And, and you could provide some of that color fairly quickly. Uh, I, I got to imagine there would be plenty of people that would be willing to help plant, um, you know, whatever we can do to, to at least make the boulevard look beautiful. So if you're going down the side street, you got something nice to look at before you have to go down. So it, if, if my fellow members are not opposed to that, I'd like to try to keep moving forward with getting that off the ground. Have any objections? Yeah, no. Let, let's blend that into this 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 cleanup, and let's. And I think there's, there's when Lee County ceded the rights to uh, vegetation for Astero Boulevard, they left us a, a tidy sum of money 
basically endowed that we could pops possibly utilize for what you're talking about yeah there was i believe it was around eight hundred thousand, if memory serves me correct i don't know what of that was used i don't think there was a huge amount maybe jason you have a better we, understanding we can double check and see because i know we got that lump sum at the beginning yeah so we can so, see how much is left and if i could mr mayor i'm sorry jason is part of this tuesday cleanup uh we really we really need to figure out a way to get the county involved as sure. well because they uh it's technically their responsibility right. but obviously we want to partner with them and sure. uh, yep. they could really i think hopefully supply some folks as well and really triage that as well and help us have a pretty big effort you know something else that kind of works in with what you're saying um but a little different angle is uh, we've been talking with murph and others about a, you know a re-green fmb kind of program where we can find some grant money hopefully and, uh, and buy native plants, and maybe as part of these, and we're going down the side streets of the neighborhoods, even Estero, you get property owners who are agreeable to actually put some of this vegetation on their property along the right of way. Um, because one of the things is, you know, you can't get a whole lot of green on a foot and a half wide strip, right? Just under power lines and on the street and view corridors and all that. But if we can get a grant to have, have money for plants and we can go into neighborhoods and doing the cleanup, and while people are cleaning up, people are planting vegetation, then we can also really make a, you know, put the, all these programs together, we can come up with a, uh, a really significant impact. Yeah, you know, the more I thought about it, you know, what got me really thinking about it was the signs, you know, the people, the street signs, the people chose those things. And that was kind of a reminder of how unique, you know, Fort Myers Beach is and how eclectic it is that people have. I know when it came to the decision that we made, I believe the previous council, we all made that was we wanted it to be uniform, we wanted it to look the same. I think if the storm has done anything, it's really shown us that we have to remember where we came from. And I think it would be, maybe if we want to revisit it, relook at that, if you are a property owner on Estero Boulevard, allowing you to use your creativity, you know, within reason, obviously, to make at least your section of that part of it unique to you or unique to the island. I think that would be really cool, kind of plays off the same idea, I think, as those street signs. You know, people would want to get involved. Obviously, I'm assuming you would, living on a stereo like that. You'd want to be able to do something that is, is, is important or means a lot to you for, for your section. So I would, I'd be willing to revisit that decision that we made about the uniformity down a stereo. I think it could be another way that we could really stand out and be unique and provide some color. And, you know, I'm all about more people, more ideas. You know, and not, just kind of think outside the box a little bit. But it sounds like everybody's on board with I think I think what you're just seeing there, that I, I, in, in my hometown of Indianapolis, there was a program where you could adopt a median, and it was often groups that would leave the businesses in front of their property or residents, and, and they could adopt that median, maybe even submit a plan for the town just to make sure it's makes you know it's not you know crazy, but I mean at least it would be. I think I think it gives it gives a uniqueness to our island. Well, in, in another reason that made me think of this was, you know, my wife and I went up to Dunedin. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you, you, you Google it and look at it. It's a, it's a neat little funky town. And we went up there around Christmas time when, of course, the weekend we went, it was 30 degrees, so it was freezing cold. <laughs> but it, Except the Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what we found, my wife actually noticed it before I did, but different businesses decorated light poles with different kind of, one had uh, Snoopy on it, and it was all lit up. And it was just really cool how they allowed the businesses to get involved, almost like that adopt the highway kind of program and, and let businesses who wanted to get involved or nonprofits that wanted to get involved, decorate a, a maybe you can't do a light pole because it's actually else, but something along the boulevard, whether it be a tree or something, it was just a really neat thing to see. And I guess they do it all year round where they, they you know, during Halloween, they do the same kind of decorations or that kind of, it was just a really cool, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You know, I know this from um, you know my 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 children. Uh, there's a lot of uh, high schools um, that will um, participate with vol volunteer mm -hmm. their students because then the the students get credit for community service. And there are some school districts and some private schools that require that all their students as part of the high, uh, high schoolers in order to be able to graduate that they do X number of community service hours. I'm all, I'm all for any kind of ideas. Yeah, my, my kids, I remember, would go to a state park um, every year, um, and half a day they would all, they'd be doing pretty much the school day, they would be out there cleaning up the state park. You know, w one idea I had, and I, I really haven't, haven't really, uh, I haven't really worked on this very much, but the idea, kind of back to, again, the, uh, the sign painters, 
is that maybe we can uh, you know, raise some money to buy mailboxes, cheap mailboxes, and then have volunteers paint them. And so right now there's obviously a shortage of mailboxes, but it would be a way to, uh, you know, not terribly expensive, but a way to start bringing back that kind of whimsical thing that the signs have with mailbox painted uniquely up and down the street. Well, I, I would, that's a great idea and actually was just brought up to me a similar idea from the people over at FMD Strong, just over the bridge. So if you wanted to reach out to, to Heidi and, and those people over there, they were looking at potentially doing something like that, purchasing mailboxes for people. Maybe that's another avenue that could be added to it. If they purchase it, then you can have a place to paint them and, and put it up. And I, I think it's fun and funky. So I like you can you can run with that. <laughs> you know where to find them. Uh, and then the last thing I have real quickly is, you know, because we are in the hurricane season now again, um, you know, it is still fresh in a lot of people's minds, obviously. Um, and we often talk about being prepared. Um, being prepared is not just before the storm, it's after the storm. And I think people need to remember that, that you can prepare to have everything ready that you think you're going to need um, as best you can. But what are you going to do if all that stuff disappears, which we saw in this storm? People were prepared or so they thought they were prepared and then their house was gone and everything that they had with them to prepare. And they were left with, what do we have to do? Um, and as we saw, people were going into Publix, and this is what made me think about it, is people were going into Publix and getting the things that they had prepared for, but were taken away. Um, so they did what they had to do. And Vice Mayor was with me at the opening of, of uh, Publix, and one of our residents actually went back and gave them a check for the things that they had taken out of Publix. So that shows the, the character and the culture of the people that we have here on the island. But it also makes me want to just get it back out there that you need to prepare for after the storm when there's no plumbing and there's no electricity and all those things like that. So don't think about just what you need before the storm. Think about what you're going to need after the storm should you lose it. I think that'll help all of us be a little bit more prepared um, should we ever have to encounter something like we did last September. So with that, I have nothing else. Anybody Move to adjourn. <laughs> got a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, we've got a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned at 1229. I think the crying baby made the motion. <laughs> <laughs>